Hello everyone, and welcome to the Imagine Verse. So we are back with an interesting movie on what if Naruto was sealed with the Kyubi and five other entities inside him. But before we start, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Let's start the story. Three deities were seated around a chessboard. The first deity was in a white robe that flowed smoothly as if it were made of water. Her face was bright, her eyes were light silver eyes. She had a coral hairpin holding her silver hair into a bun that allowed her to think clearly. The second deity had black hair with gold eyes set into a face that was dark in the most beautiful way. The only thing that was not beautiful was the extreme predatory look in her eyes. She was in a red form-fitting dress, with a deep versus cut on the front a back coming to a point just below her ample bust on the front and her lower back. The final one was seated between the two. Her midnight black hair was straightened with a slight curl at the end, her pupilless eyes were surrounded with a light black eyeliner. Her dress was the darkest black, almost what looked like an endless void of nothingness, if one looked close enough they could almost see what looked like faces tugging ever so slightly on the fabric. I won this game, big sister, the red deity told the white one. I know, stop gloating, the white deity told the red pouting a little. Enough, have both of you finished with any duties you had to attend to before we start this next match? The dark deity asked her siblings. Both deities looked at their subordinates. One was a small woman with golden hair and light blue eyes, the other was a brood of a man covered in what looked like dark spikes. Kami Sama, you are free for the next couple thousand years, the golden haired woman told the white deity. Thank you, Tenshi Chan, Kami told the woman, before nodding to the woman in black. Yami Sama, you are also free for what looks to be about 3,000 years, the spiked man told the red deity. That's great, Akuma kun. Just try to keep Unmei Chan from running to wild, Yami told the man. He a mistress. The man replied. Both the subordinates walked out of the room. The door closed, then the room went pitch black and suddenly the chessboard lit up. The pieces that were broken or lost reformed and returned where they had started. So after fury was destroyed, trace amounts of magic was left that leaked into the soil and into the animals. Nine of these animals have been tormenting the world for the last couple hundred years. The humans that were left over from the disaster also abosorbed magic, they now call it chakra. Before you are the pieces that you have chosen for this event. Are there any rules that you two wish to lay down before we start? The black dressed deity asked. If I win, you spend the next millennium at mom's house talking to her. Yami proposed to Kami. And if I win, you have to let me dress you in what I want. Kami counter proposed to Yami. Now that the wagers have been set, I have one final question. The black dressed deity paused, increasing dramatic effect. Do either of you have to go to the bathroom? She asked. Both of the other deities' sweat dropped at this. Just start the game, Shinigami, both of them yelled at her. Shinigami nodded and clicked her fingers, the board turned a light brown and flared slightly. Elemental Nations, Fire Country, Kohanagakure, Underground Bunker. A large explosion caused the underground bunker to rumble. A little bit of dust fell on the people around the hospital bed where a red haired woman was currently pushing as hard as she could. Damn it, just come out already, the woman screamed. Almost here, just one more push, a platinum blonde haired woman told the red head. You don't think I know, yelled the red headed woman, as she pushed with all her strength, bending the bed frame that she had a grip on. Suddenly all the pain was gone, replaced by a whimper, then a sudden outburst of wailing. The platinum blonde woman wrapped the baby in a blue towel, handing it to the red head. Congratulations Kashina, it's a boy, the platinum blonde told the red head. Naruto, my little Naru kun. My Sochi, you are gonna be so strong when you grow up. Kashina told the sun kissed blonde boy. He opened his eye upon hearing Kashina's voice, with a happy gurgle, he grabbed some of her hair and chomped down on it. Well, he has a thing for redheads, Hasunade. Huh, Kashina asked the platinum blonde woman. That he does. Tsunade replied smiling gently at the baby. Feeling that he was being watched he turned his head to the head medical ninja of the elemental nations. He just smiled and made a happy gurgle. Where is Minato? And what the hell is going on up there? Kashina asked fearfully, another explosion rocking the bunker. Naruto started to cry at the sudden violation of force. 
Kashina, who was about to start calming Naruto, suddenly doubled over in pain. Ah! Kashina screamed as a dark red chakra started to flow out of her. Tsunade grabbed Naruto away from her and flared her chakra as high as she could, signaling to Minato that something was wrong. Unfortunately for the Sanin another had felt the signal. Out of the shadows a man in a black jacket with a white mask showing a sad face behind the Sanin. Quickly and effectively giving a chop to the back of the neck. Swiftly grabbing the baby from the falling woman. He stood and started at the woman in the bed, who was growling at the man. The red chakra starting to form a fox-like cloak around the woman. Release it. The man stated at Kashina. Give. Me. My. Sochi. Kashina growled at the man. Shaking his head, the man flicked a kunia out and held it above the infant's body. Kashina growled more, seeing the man threaten her son pissed her off beyond measure. Release it now, or your son dies. The man told Kashina in a tight voice, that held no emotion, nothing, as if void of everything. Fine. You don't know what you are asking for. Kashina told the man, lifting her shirt and forcing chakra to her stomach. A partially worn seal appeared. Kashina tapped six points around the seal, suddenly a huge amount of chakra shot up and into the ceiling. Good girl. No offense, now I have to kill you, the man said, only to suddenly dodge a bright blue sphere that appeared out of mid-air. Leave my family out of this. A blonde-haired man spoke from the other side of the sad masked man. The masked man whirled around looking for the man, suddenly the object in his arms felt heavier, he looked down to see a log in his arms. He looked up towards the bed to see that the man had his son and was standing between the masked man and his wife. Kashina, are you okay? The man asked with concern in his voice. Minato, I'm sorry, he made me release the Kayubi, Kashina told Minato. Minato nodded, he knew what he had to do, he watched the man, who just sunk into the shadow. My master will not be pleased, the man said as he faded from the room. Kashina, we have to go. You know what we have to do, Minato started. No, not that. Minato, how can we ask our son to be one? A Jinchuriki, can we not seal it back into me? Kashina begged her husband. Kashina, you fully know that we can't do that. This is the only way Kohanagakure can survive. I can't ask somebody else to sacrifice their child if I'm not even willing to risk my own. Minato finally snapped at her, tears dripping from his eyes. Kashina saw the look of fear for his son, the longing to stay with him, to be with them both in this world. Fine. I don't like this, but let's do it, Kashina told her husband. It was not lost upon Minato the way his wife had just spoke. The Yandaimi Hokage started to say something, only to see that his wife held the same look he had not only moments ago. With a nod of his head, he grabbed his wife and they flashed to the front lines. Numbers of Iwa and Kumo ninja were scattered as the Kayubi appeared and started to create havoc among the three fighting forces. Iwa and Kumo saw this as an opportunity to retreat, fleeing with their already decimated forces from the Kahona ninjas. Near the front lines, ten miles from Kohanagakure the sad-faced masked man pulled himself out of a tree. Only seconds later two more people landed next to him. One had a blank face mask on, and the other had a happy face mask on. He he he, did she die quickly? Ha 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 ha. The happy-faced man asked the sad-faced man, giggling. I didn't get a chance to kill them, that yellow-haired bastard got there to quick. The sad-faced man told the two in a sober tone. The blank face pulled out a pocket watch from his jacket and clicked it open. It looks like Kami and Yami-sama have started another game. Ha 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 ha, you would think they would stop after hundred of matches, he he he. The happy man retorted through fits of laughter. Shut it, both of you. Blank man ordered, as they watched the Kayubi get sucked into a spot. Oh, poo. I wanted to watch some more destruction, the sad man told them. We do what they have told us to do, we watch. The blank man told both of his companions, with that the three vanished. If only they had stayed for a few more seconds they would have seen five balls of light slowly fall from the sky, pulsing with energy land where the Kayubi had been sealed. Realm of the Gods Kami's side of the chessboard, right before Shinigami started the game. One of the pawns on Kami's side of the board suddenly turned into another queen. What in the seven hells? All three of the goddesses said at once, only to look at each other, I didn't do that. Then who did? 
once again speaking at the same time. I'm now interested, Yami said in a curious tone, looking at the pieces, as they started to move on the board. Konohagakure, ten years after the Kayubi incident a blonde ten-year-old boy with ocean blue eyes and matching whisker marks on both cheeks was currently running for his life. From what you say, a mob of drukan and angry villagers. What in the living hell did I do this time? The blonde yelled at them. You killed our families, you monster. You desreve to die, turning into a child so you could kill us one by one. One of the villagers told him in a cold tone. I haven't done anything. The blonde replied back, suddenly being pitched forward as he was hit by a bottle to his head. Nice aim. Thanks, now let's get him, the bottle thrower told the crowd. Suddenly it was a mad house to get to the blonde first, wailing and punching, kicking and stabbing. Finally a ninja pushed themselves to the front of the group. What would the Hokage say if he saw all of this? Huh? How would you explain this? The ninja voiced. The crowd stopped, the air starting to tremble with nervousness at what the Hokage would do to them. That's why you need to dispose of the evidence. The ninja told them, finishing the hand seals for a jutsu. Kaden. Grand fireball jutsu, the ninja said before sucking up a huge amount of air and blowing out a giant fireball that hit the blonde. Engulfing the poor boy, or so they thought. Seeing a burnt body, the villagers shouted in celebration at finally killing the demon, scum, monster. Soon the mob had dispersed and Anbu arrived to take the body to the hospital again. A few minutes after the Anbu left, a mop of blonde hair slowly pulled himself out of the shadows. Looking around, he started to head home it was getting rather late. Geez you would think they would have stopped using Cadence on me after the first time, Naruto told nobody in particular. Well, we just can't have them destroy our host, that would be bad for all of us, a gruff masculine voice replied. I know that they are gonna feel funny when they find out they destroyed a cadaver from the morgue. Again, Naruto told the voice. That is a riot, but it is starting to get old, a metallic sounding voice replied this time. I know, I know. So what am I going to be learning tomorrow? Naruto wondered. We were thinking on how to combine Dragon Slayer arts with chakra control. Even though they are slightly different. Chakra and what we had called magical arts. One of two feminine voices spoke up. Well are we gonna have a roulette or a drawing or what? Naruto asked. We think we'll start with either metal or sky Dragon Slayer forms, then start from there. A husky voice confirmed with force. The other voices agreed, well almost all of them. One wanted to teach him the fire dragon slayer form first, but he had been outvoted by the other five. Anyways Kit, Hatchling. You need to get some rest. Tomorrow is gonna be a long day. All the voices said at once, more like conjoined rather than one. As the boy started to slumber, his mind wandered back to when he first met his tenants. At first it was a huge hassle to keep them all happy. Flashback, five years ago. Kohanakagor Hospital. Geez, they dumped me in a damn sewer this time. This is disgusting. Do they know what is in this fucking stuff? Welp, I better get out of here. Naruto stated matter of factly. Naruto got up and started to walk, and walk, and walk. Damn it, when the hell is this gonna end? Naruto shouted to no one in general, he didn't expect to hear a reply from behind him. What did you say, monkey? A creepy voice asked from behind sending shivers up Naruto's spine. Slowly turning around, he came face to face with a large door made up of bars. There was a slip of paper on it that said, Seal 1 6th. Naruto walked up to it, Hello, who's in there? Suddenly an alarm went off in his head. Naruto jumped back as a set of claws shot forward scratching the ground where he had been standing. This monkey has good reflexes, I've seen what those worthless villagers have treated you. I can give you the power to destroy this village, to kill, maim, tear everything from the heart of this destitute of a village. Do you wish that, well little monkey? The voice asked. Naruto took a thinking pose, then looked at the cage with a smirk. You want my answer, well my answer is to go fuck yourself. Even if they destroy me, I will protect them with my life. I'll never take power to destroy my home. I would rather die than hurt this village. Naruto told the cage, flipping the cage off. Bawahahaha, it's been about 30 years since a monkey had the balls to do that to me. So you pass. The voice to him with a pleased tone. What the seven fucks was that? 
Naruto asked, basically yelling at the caged doors. A test. The voice replied. A test. Naruto repeated, sweat dropping a little. I needed to test you before I allowed you to meet the others. Guys he's okay, you can come out now. The creepy voice called out, the claws withdrew and was replaced with a hand as the landscape changed from a sewer into a large plateau. With mountains running around the edges. Okay, what in the hell is going on? First we were in a sewer, now we are in the mountains. And who the hell is, everyone, mhmmhmhmhm. Naruto was cut off of his ranting by a feminine hand. We'll tell you. If you shut up. A woman replied. Naruto looked at the arm that was attached to a beautiful woman with cream colored skin, and slivery gray hair. Her eyes were a deep crimson red with a slit down the middle. She also had two red ears on the top of her head, and nine red tails with silver tips. The woman wore a snug fitting red kaminio with silver foxes running on them. MHMHMM. Okay. Naruto replied as she let go, taking a deep breath. The glare from this lady made him stop his rant. Now back to your first question, you are in your mindscape. Those idiotic villagers beat you into a coma again. The second question is since it is your mindscape you can change it how you see fit, but everyone has agreed that it would be better if it looked like this. Finally, the last answer is right behind you. The woman told him. Naruto turned around to see five other people standing to form a circle around him. Going on his instincts, Naruto sunk to the ground and put his hands over his head. Please don't kill me. I didn't mean to do it, I promise. Naruto started to crying, not being able to help himself. Have the villagers beaten him down this far? All the people there thought at the same time with sadness. Hey, brat. Get your ass up, we ain't gonna hurt you. A red haired man with a red beard growled at Naruto, only to make him shrink further into himself. Igneo, you are stupid. Growling at the hatchling. A man with dark gray hair and piercing all over his face berated the now named Igneo. It's not my fault we got stuck here. Who was the one that said we should jump into the giant vortex in the sky? Huh, Metallicana. Igneo retorted. How were we supposed to know it would just send us into the future? A man with white hair replied in a calm demeanor. The white hair covered the left side of his face. Enough fighting, we are scaring the hatchling and we haven't even introduced ourselves. A man told Naruto, he looked exactly like the man with white hair except it was black colored and on the right. It's okay now Naruto, you have a family here. I'm Grandine. The other woman with sky blue hair and a gray kaminio with clouds covering it told the young blonde. She knelt down and held open her arms like a mother waiting for their child. Naruto rushed into her arms, crying loudly. Both Grandine and the other woman gently stroked Naruto's hair, calming him down until he could sit and understand what was going on. Now, proper introductions. The firehead is Igneo, the metal face is Metallicana, the Yin-Yang twins are Skiadrum and Wysolohia, Grandine is the nicest one here. Finally, I'm the Kyubi no Kitsune. Stated the Kyubi. Skiadrum and Wysolohia were barely holding a pissed off Igneal and Metallicana from jumping on Kyubi and beating the hell out of her. Nice to meet you Ni and Ne Sans, Naruto replied with a huge smile. It's nice to meet you to Hatchling. Now we need to talk to you about how you are gonna get by for the next few years. At least till you become a ninja. Igneal stated. The rest of the people nodded. What do you mean, get by, Naruto asked them. Well we can't have you be in the hospital every other day. Now can we? Metallicana answered, with a slightly cocky smile. Okay, so how do we do that? Naruto wondered, taking a thinking pose. Did we get stuck in a moron? All the tenants thought at the same time. Wait. Ski and knee, you're dark. So can you control like shadows and stuff? Naruto asked the dark haired individual. Kantoral, my dear little hatchling. I am. Shadows. The dark haired individual stated before sinking into his own shadow and coming up behind Igneal. Igneal grabs Skiadrum and throws him into the side of a mountain. You know I hate it when you do stuff like that. Igneal states to Skiadrum. Skiadrum smiled misguivously. Anyways, my idea was what if Ski and Ni teaches me to hide myself? Naruto stated to the group. That's. a. great. idea. They all actually looked at Naruto as if they had an alien monster from another world on their hands. Igneal walked over and squatted down to be at his level. 
Igniel stared with interested focus, after a few minutes he messes up Naruto's hair. You'll be fine, Nat, Naruto. Igniel started to say something else, but caught himself at the last second. The rest of the group looked at Igniel with sadness, knowing that he had loved his hatchling the most. So, what are you guys? I know the Kyubi, but what about you guys and girl? Naruto asked bluntly. Should we tell him? Waisalohia asked them. He's gonna find out sooner or later. Why not sooner? Our other hatchlings were younger than him when they found us. Skiadram replied to his look alike. Metallicana grabbed the twins and thumped their heads together, he then turned to Grandine and nodded. Naru kun, we are dragons. Grandine told him in a gentle voice. Okay. Naruto stated, now how'd I get out of here? Are you not surprised at all? Don't you have any questions regarding us, Metallicana? Nope. You guys are dragons and she is the Kyubi. Somehow you all got sealed in me along with her. So again, how do I get out of here? Naruto explained as he pointed at the Kyubi. It's your mind, shouldn't you know how? Igniel asked him in a teaching tone. Um. Yes, no, maybe? Naruto asked. Before you go, we want you to do something for us. If we are gonna be able to teach you we need you to be able to communicate with you. To do that, you need to pull a small part of the seal off, just like a corner. We promise not to try and force any more. Waisalohia, Skiadram hands up now. Grandine snapped at the two troublemakers. Both of them snapped to attention and held their hands up. Okay. Where are your seals at? Naruto asked, knowing that he needed to do this to become stronger. Igniel held out a ring. Metallicana pointed to his piercings, both Waisalohia and Skiadram held out a wristband, and both Grandine and the Kyubi pointed at their collars. Naruto went around to each of their items and removed a little bit off each thing. The pieces of the seals turned into a black wristband that looked like a dragon wrapping around his wrist. This is cool. Naruto said out loud. Everyone started to laugh, even though he showed increased thought process they had to remember that he was still just a child even if he was a little mature. Now, you need to wake up. You need to tell the old monkey everything. The Kyubi told Naruto, then flicked his forehead. Konohikagor Hospital, Room 205. Ow, stupid vixen. Naruto yelled as he popped up, rubbing his forehead. Naruto, finally awake I see. I'm glad that the Anbu were able to get to you before they tried to actually destroy you. An old man in formal robes stated, here sat Serutobi Hirazan the Sandame Hokage. Yeah Gigi, was it cat this time, or weasel? Naruto asked the Serutobi. Actually, it was snake. She was doing her normal rounds when she spotted you. Serutobi replied, puffing on his pipe. Ah, I see. Hey, Gigi. Why didn't you tell me that the Kyubi was sealed in me? Naruto asked in a calm and hard tone. Serutobi sighed. He took his pipe from his lips and set it on the table next to him. He then got up and went beside Naruto. There are many things that I am unable to tell you. Kyubi being sealed inside of you is one of them. I promise that when you reach a certain age or you reach Chunin, I will tell you everything. Serutobi told the young blonde. Hey hatchling, don't forget us. He might not believe what you say, but it's easier to tell him about us now than to have him suffer from a heart attack later. Gradian told the blonde. So the communication works, anything anybody wants to tell me before I explain to Gigi what the hell is going on? Naruto asked the beings in his gut. Yeah, ask the old man for what you guys call chakra weights and a scroll on the beginnings of Fuinjutsu. It might take a few years, but with time and experience you might be able to reverse summon some of us to help you in time of duress. Kayubi told him. Naruto nodded to himself then started to explain to the aged Hokage what happened and what the requests were. Surprised, amazed, astonished are all understatements to what the aged Hokage had on his face when the young blonde got done talking. A look of complete flabbergast was on his face as he found out that not only were dragons real and not legendary, but five of them were sealed into this boy and they wanted to teach him their art forms. Okay, let's see what your elemental affinities so that I can get you the proper scrolls to learn from. Serutobi already had a list out and was writing down what Naruto would need. He then gave Naruto a sheet of paper. Channel your chakra into this and we'll see what you can start with, Serutobi explained. Naruto nodded and started to channel chakra into the paper. 
The paper was sliced twice to make four pieces. One piece burnt up rather quickly, the second piece turned gray and crumbled, the third piece grew lighter until it was almost too bright to see, the final piece turned oily black and seemed almost weightless. So as we can see, you have wind, fire, what looks like earth and two elements that I haven't seen before. I'll have to see what these are, I'll see what I can get you. Serutobi explained to the young blonde. Those are probably shadow and light. Naruto told the aged man. If I think correctly, I should be able to bend shadows and lights to hide my appearance or others. That should be the basics anyways. Oh, well then I'll have to see if one of the more energetic Naras could help you with the shadow. The light on the other hand, that's going to be more complicated. I mean no one has had a chakra like this in over thousands of years. Serutobi told the young boy, thinking. I'll have everything sent to your apartment and we'll talk to Anara in a few days. Serutobi told the boy. But for now, let's get you some food. Ramen sound good. Hell yeah. Naruto exclaimed as he jumped out of the hospital bed and got dressed. Present, Naruto's apartment Naruto yawned loudly, while he pulled his nightclothes on. They consisted of a pair of black bottoms, and dark blue top with a fox on it, and to finish it off a dragon knight hat. Night knee and nay sans. I'll see you tomorrow. Naruto told his family as he fell asleep, dreaming of ramen and training. Good night, Kit, Hatchling. The group replied knowing that they needed to prepare him for the future. An eleven-year-old Naruto stood in front of the ninja academy gates, looking at all the smiling children and wondering if he should even go in. He had never been really good at making friends, of course it never helped that the families would keep their children away or encourage them to bully him. Naruto, are you going in? An aged voice asked him. Naruto looked up next to him and saw the aged Hokage was next to him. Naruto sighed and stared back onto the schoolyard. I don't know if I should. I mean, what if no one likes me? Naruto wondered in a worried tone. One that the Hokage had heard many times before. If it helps, Shikamaru has joined the academy this year also. Serutobi told the blonde. Naruto nodded, for the past couple of years the Naras have been teaching Naruto the basics on shadow bending. More than once, Naruto trained with the young Nara. Though the Nara would have rather watched clouds than train. Many times they played shogi or chess. Unfortunately for the pre-teen, he had not been able to beat the Nara yet. Naruto saw the young Shadow Wilder with his friend Shoji Akamichi, a larger boy with two red swirls on his cheeks that was almost always eating on a bag of chips. He was fiercely loyal to Shikamaru. Both him and Naruto had an eating competition every Thursday, switching between Ichiraku Ramen and one of the barbecue joints the Akamichi clan owns. So far it was 56 to 55 in Naruto's favor. Naruto waved at the two clan heirs as he walked into the schoolyard. They waved back, before they went back to watching the clouds and eating. Naruto took in the other children, most of them from the civilian clans, with some ninja clan heirs thrown in. As he sat beside the Nara, he observed the children that were running around. Who do you think we have for a sensei? Naruto asked the pineapple-haired preteen. I'm guessing Uruka sensei. He was just recently placed here, so we might be his first class, Shikamaru commented. I think you were right, want to see how good he is? Naruto inquired. Huh, sure. Why not? Might be interesting, Shikamaru answered in a bored tone. How should we do it? Plan Alpha Zeta or Beta Gamma? Naruto asked. Hmm, both of those have too many harmful possibilities. How about Charlie Echo? Shikamaru replied after a moment of thinking. That takes too long to set up. Naruto whined. We got about 10 minutes before class starts. I've seen you said Charlie Echo in less than four. Shikamaru told him. True. Welp, let me get to work. Naruto stated before he got up and walked to the classroom 1A. A few minutes later the class wandered into the classroom, which looked perfectly normal, to the untrained eye. Many of the children sat down and started talking amongst themselves, not knowing the wonder that was going to enter their days in just a few minutes. Good morning class, my name is Aruka Amino. I'll be your Chunin teacher for the next four years. I'll start by doing roll call, then we'll start on the history of the Shinobi world. Aruka stated as he walked in and introduced himself. Suddenly there was a large poof of smoke as soon as he reached the podium, 
After the smoke cleared you can find an upside down Uruka hanging from the ceiling with orange and black paint on his uniform. A note was placed on him, for all to read. You have just been pranked by Naruto Uzumaki, the note read. Which one of you is Naruto? Uruka asked, very calmly. A blonde boy stood up and waved his hand from the back. I am, it's good to see that you fell for it sensei. Naruto told him smiling broadly. Well, it's very good. Now, let me down from here, Uruka yelled as his head grew. Uruka went cut the ninja wire with a kuniya. Nananananono, don't do that Uruka sensei. I've combined Charlie Echo with Bravo Zeta. Naruto told the chunin in a worried tone. Uruka looked at him with a, what are you talking about look, before he cut the ninja wire. As Uruka dropped, some kanai and shuriken shot from the back of the room aiming at the now crouched Uruka. Seeing the deadly ninja tools flying towards him, he used a kawarimi jutsu to switch himself with one of the books in the back. Panting slightly, Uruka got up and walked over to Naruto. Holding a rather thick book, he looked down at Naruto. Charlie Echo with Bravo Zeta. Interesting combo. Just how did you pull this off? Uruka asked the preteen. The teachers need to get here earlier. That's all I'm gonna say. Naruto told him suddenly found himself with his head on the desk. A large knot forming on his head from where Uruka hit Naruto with the book. Now that this is over, I'll start again, Uruka stated, starting with roll call then the lesson. Hatchling, you should have thought about that before you did it. Sometimes you are too irrational. Igniel told Naruto through the mental link. Doesn't mean I can't find out how good people are. I give Uruka a 4, Naruto replied. I would have given him a 5 if he had dogged all the weapons, Metallicana popped off. I would have used some flash bombs, or something to blind him before letting the second trap sprung, Wysolohia commented. I didn't want to blind everybody, just make them laugh, Naruto snapped at them. Naruto, Uruka is waiting on you to answer a question. The answer is the Senju clan. Grandine quickly informed the blonde. Naruto who was one of the nomadic ninja clans that helped form and set the rules of Konohakagor. Uruka asked the blonde as he was pulled out of his mental conversation with his knee and nay sans. One of the nomadic ninja clans that helped form and set the rules for Konohakagor would be the Senju clan. Naruto informed the chunin. Good job, I would seem you actually do pay attention. Uruka told him with a smile. Doesn't help when you have one 5,000 year old, demon and five twenty-five thousand year old dragons skiadram commented with a smirk what in the world are we learning anyways is this a new form of torture igniel asked noticing that half the class was already asleep finally after what seemed like a lifetime the tort the teaching was finished and all the kids braked for lunch naruto went over to a tree and sat down pulling out a scroll he unsealed a bowl of fresh spinach with walnuts and raisins with this spring salad was a strawberry vingaret. Salad for lunch, yuck. We need meat, Igniel shouted. You guys get meat the rest of the meals other than the twice a month ramen eating competition that Naruto has with Choji. So stuff it, before I take that salad and shove it where the sun don't shine. Kayubi explained to the meat craving dragon. No, IG Nissan. Q Nissan is right. I need to start eating more than meat and ramen. It's better if I start now. Naruto told Igniel. Fine. By the way, did you notice that little girl being picked on? Grandine mentioned. Naruto set his salad off to the side and looked up seeing a blue haired girl being picked on by three kids, two girls and a boy. One of them being almost double the poor girl's size, this girl had pushed the girl down and was kicking dirt on her. Naruto growled gently, clenching his fist so hard that his knuckles started to turn white. The poor blue net was crying. The bullies had started to pick on her because of her eyes and her clan. You know I'm surprised anyone would want to be around you. Your clan is a bunch of spying freaks, with those weirdo eyes. One of the girls teased the blue net. The poor girl was about to run away when she heard a heavy thud in front of her. A blonde haired boy was standing in front of her, with a grimace on his face. It's not nice to pick on people, just cause you think they look weird. What if I told you you look like a gorilla cause you're bigger than everyone? The boy retorted to the girl. You can't say that to me. I'm a girl and you are a boy, the girl replied. Oh, you can do it to another girl, but since I'm a boy, I can't tease back, 
the boy asked. Erta Kuhn, he's being mean to me. Are you gonna just let him say stuff like that to me? The girl asked the larger boy. Nobody talks to my Nasan like that and expects to not get beat up. Erta told the small blonde as he threw a fist at him. There was a loud smack of flesh hitting something metallic. Erta pulled his fist back and started to pucker up. Ah! Oh. Erta cried, my hand, you broke my hand. His fingers were bent in weird angles and blood was starting to flow from his knuckles. I didn't do anything, you did that yourself. The boy explained, it's not my fault that I have better bone structure than you do. We're telling Uruka sensei. Come on guys, the gorilla girl told the blonde. The blonde huffed before he turned around and held out a hand to the brunette. The young girl gently took his hand, and was pulled up gently. A heim should never be dirty. A heim's knight should always make sure she is taken care of. The blonde boy told her, as he gently brushed off her outfit. May I ask what your name is heim? The blonde asked. H. H. Hanada H. H. Hyuga. The young heiress stuttered out. Hinaheim, a beautiful name. The blonde replied, I'm. Naruto Uzumaki, come here right now. Uruka yelled out. Naruto sighed as he saw that two out of the trio of bullies were behind Uruka, making faces at Naruto. Naruto nodded and started to walk towards them, his skin starting to give off a slightly grayish hue. Suddenly Hinata grabbed his hand and started walking with him. Naruto looked at the blue-haired heiress, seeing her blush ever so slightly. Naruto nodded as his heartbeat started to slow down and his adrenaline started to cut back. Now, Naruto. I would like you to explain how you broke Urtakun's hand, Uruka asked sternly. Like I told them, it's not nice to pick on people that are smaller than you or what you would consider a freak. In my own opinion think that Hinata-chan is a lot prettier than the gorilla or her cohort. When I told them that, Urta went to hit me and broke his hand. Naruto explained, Hinata nodding her head as the blonde was explaining. Uruka turned to the two bully with a stern look on his face. Well girls is this true? Where you bullying Hinata-chan? No Uruka sensei Naruto is lying. Hinata fell and we were helping her up, the bigger girl told him. I never said anything about Hinata being on the ground, now did I, Naruto stated, making sure that they knew they had been caught. Both girls got a wide, deer in headlights look, knowing that they had been caught. Uruka slowly tapped his foot as he listened to the reasoning. Girls. I think that both your parents and Irda's parents talked to me after school. Uruka told them. Then he turned to Naruto, Naruto, the Hokage will be here after school to talk with me also, so please stay after class. Hi Uruka sensei. Naruto grumbled out, knowing that if he even skipped the after school, talk, the Hokage would double the weight he had on now. Why should the hatchling stay behind, when it was those bullies fault? Skiadram asked. Skiani. It's fine. It's probably due to me using Metni's teachings. I did it unconsciously. My face hardened in the spot that Irda's fist hit me. Naruto explained to Skiadram. What? That's stupid. It's not your fault that he was a meathead. Wysolohia complained. We'll just let it go. One of the ninja's rule is to look underneath the underneath. Igniel told them all. Naruto nodded both at Aruka and to himself. Now if you'll excuse me. I need to get back to my lunch before anything happens to it. Naruto explained before bowing and walking back to his salad, which a tallish thin boy with a high collared coat and sunglasses on was standing next to. Naruto, being weary of what could turn into a new problem, walked over and sat down, continuing to eat his salad. Is that strawberry? the boy asked. Yes, it is. Would you like some? Naruto asked him. Yes, my bugs found the scent interesting. The boy explained as a kakaichu bug crawled onto his finger. Ah. Oh, here you can have some. By the way, I'm Naruto. Naruto offered as he set a sake saucer of the vingaret down next to the boy. Shino. The boy replied as he sat down and let his insects enjoy the sweet and tangy vingaret. Shino. This is Hanada. Naruto motioned to the blue net next to him. Shino looked at Hanada with an emotionless face before nodding at her. Hanada blushed slightly and hid beside Naruto as he had introduced her. After lunch the class had the beginning taijutsu training, to show the basics of the academy style taijutsu. Now we'll have a one-on-one -on -one taijutsu match. Let's start with Kiba Inazuka versus Naruto Uzumaki. Haruka stated, looking at the list. 
Naruto stood up and faced across from his opponent, a wild looking preteen with two red triangles on his cheeks. Well, I get to start with a shrimp. Soon I'll be top dog at this school. Kiba told the young blonde, peacocking to try and make himself seem better. The blonde just looked at the wild preteen as if he suddenly grew ears and a tail, before nodding and got into a basic tiajutsu stance. Naruto, do not use the metal dragon art or the wind dragon art. Kayubi told him, we want you to seem like you are a weakling, remember a ninja's biggest weapon. Is to keep their true power secret. Naruto finished, nodding at Kiba, as Kiba got into his family's tiajutsu form. Uruka started the match and stepped back to watch the match. Kiba rushed Naruto, trying to nail Naruto with a clothesline. Naruto ducked under the move, and struck out with a high kick to try and bring down the wild child. Kiba grabbed the foot and flipped Naruto back, then advanced on the blonde to hit try and strike him again. Naruto landed in a crouch from Kiba flipping him. Naruto then rushed forward and attempted a gut shot. Kiba weaved around the punch, aiming a kick to Naruto's ribs. Naruto grabbed the kick and with a grunt flung Kiba toward the edge of the Tiajutsu ring. Kiba flipped, landing on his feet, skidding back till the balls of his feet barely touched the inside of the ring. Almost shrimp, but no dice. Kiba commented, then dropped to all fours to rush the blonde. Naruto smirked, and held a wide stance, waiting for Kiba to reach him. Right as Kiba pulled back for a swing, Naruto disappeared. Or at least that's Kiba thought only to have a sudden weight on his shoulders. Looking up he saw Naruto was doing a handstand on his shoulders. Naruto smiled a big shit-eating grin and gripped Kiba's jacket and fell back. As soon as his feet hit the ground, he threw Kiba into the ground, getting a loud audible smack and maybe a crack from the wild boy. Kiba laid on the ground, groaning slightly, Naruto walked over and held out a hand. Kiba looked at the hand and took it, smirking slightly. Next time Naruto. I won't go easy on you, Kiba told the blonde. Next time, I won't let you, Naruto replied with a shit-eating grin, before they both walked over and sat next to Hinata and Shino. Naruto-san, your fight was interesting, Shino told the young blonde. Thank you Shino, that was very nice of you to say, Naruto replied to the insect user's comment. Hinata just looked at Naruto nervously, maybe I can get him to help me with my Juken form. That last move didn't look like he could have pulled it off. Naruto, I did not know you could do something like that. Troublesome. Shikamaru smirked slightly, knowing that his friend was an enigma. We tell you to not be conspicuous, and you have to do a showboat move. You're lucky that you were able to pull it off, one second too soon or late you would have missed it. Grandine scolded the blonde dragon container. Sorry Grand Nay, I was still a little pissed off from before, Naruto replied. We know Naruto, but now we need to be careful, we don't want any more attention than what we already have. Igneal warned Naruto. Naruto nodded before going back and watching the matches, none really interesting till a black haired with what looked like a duck tail in the back got up to fight Hinata. The boy just huffed and got into a stance that Naruto had seen a few times before, he was an Uchiha, a clan of the Ives. Full of arrogant shitheads, that thought of themselves on a high platform than the rest of Konohikagor. The close second was the Hyuga, at least they did their own work on jutsus. The sticks up their asses were almost the same length. Naruto focused on the fight, seeing Hinata struggle with the Juken form. He noticed that Hinata could do better with a more fluid system rather than the static version of the main form. Yes, she could use some training. That form she has is utterly useless on her. Hatchling you were right, she could be more fluid with her motions. Igneal commented. Let's talk to her after school today. Naruto replied to the fire dragon. All of the beings nodded, some while smirking ever so slightly. Hey Igneal, are we gonna have another L and N thing going on? Or are we actually going to push them to get together? Metallicana asked. Igneal growled gently, before he turned and punched Metallicana into one of the mountains. Shut it. Igneal told the metal dragon. Soon it came to the end of the day. As the rest of the children ran to meet their parents, five children stayed behind to await their punishment. Naruto, Hanada, and the three bullies. The Hokage and the bullies' parents went in and talked to Uruka first, then the students were called in after a few minutes. The parents looked furious and were muttering things about demons playing angels. 
The Hokage and Uruka stopped the muttering with a few glares. Uruka asked Naruto and Hinata to explain what happened. Hinata started, explaining that she had been looking for a place to eat her lunch when the bullies came up and started to pick on her. They had pushed her onto the ground and started to tease her because of her eyes. Naruto then picked up as he saw Hinata was getting nervous and started to hide behind him. Naruto explained that he went and defended Hinata and was struck by Urda, who then had a broken hand. Uruka looked at the parents as they listened to the story. They seemed unconcerned about Hinata. It wasn't until Naruto got the point in the story that Urda hit him that an expression was shown on their faces, one of anger and rage, directed at the young blonde for hurting Urda. They were about to say something, but were denied as the Hokage stood. I'm sorry, I should have warned Uruka san of Naruto's condition. You see, Naruto not only has heightened healing, but also has denser bones. So it is only natural that when Urta hit Naruto his hand broke. I will pay for all medical and Naruto is going to apologize for forcing Urta san into striking him. Serutobi told the parents, motioning for Naruto to step forward. Naruto started to step forward, only to be held back by Hinata. No, it wasn't Naruto's fault. They started it, they need to be punished. Hinata forcefully told the Hokage. My dear Hinata, how would we do that? Knowing that this cycle will continue if we punish them. Naruto. Serutobi looked at the boy. Naruto nodded, turning to the parents of the bullies he bowed. I'm sorry for pushing Urta to hit me. I will not do it again. The parents looked amazed at this 11-year-old apologizing for nothing. Suddenly Irda's father smacked the back of Irda's head. OWWW, what the? Urta started, you will apologize to Miss Hyuga and Mr. Uzumaki, now. Irta's father told the boy. I'm so. Urta mumbled. Louder, or you will get a worse punishment, his father ordered. Geez, I'm sorry. Urta told Naruto and Hinata. Now, this will not happen again. Understood. Irda's father told him. Yes sir. Urta responded. Irda's father nodded and went to the door. He motioned for Urta to follow him, the others followed. Serutobi smiled as he watched them leave, before he turned to Naruto, frowning. Naruto, did you use, that, unintentionally? Serutobi asked. Naruto nodded looking down, gripping his fist tightly. Serutobi knelt down, and placed his hand on the boy's shoulder. He then placed his other hand on the boy's head. Naruto looked up and saw a serious look on Serutobi's face. It's all right this time, but you need to learn to control your emotions. You cannot wear your heart on your sleeve. Serutobi explained. Hia. Naruto replied. Serutobi smiled, getting up he looked over to the young Hyuga. Now I believe that Miss Hyuga needs to be escorted home. Serutobi told the young blonde. Yes sir. Naruto replied happily, come on Hinata-chan. Naruto grabbed Hinata's hand and started walking out of the academy and towards the Hyuga compound. With Uruka and Serutobi, how did you know Naruto would apologize to them? Uruka asked the aged Hokage. Because he knows the hurt of being acknowledged in being a demon, do demons apologize? Hokage answered Uruka's question with another. I guess you're right Hokage-sama. A demon would not have apologized, Uruka answered. The Hokage chuckled gently as he watched the two preteens walk out the academy gates. With Naruto and Hinata, ten minutes later, outside the Hyuga compound. Well Hinata, we got you home safe and sound, if you need to be protected anymore just yell for me. I'll always come running. Naruto smiled gently at the young heiress. HH Hia. Hinata stuttered out. Two Hyuga guards, just stood there watching the touching moment until they heard a coughing sound come from behind them. Hiyashi Hayuga stood in the gateway leading to the compound, with a stern look on his face and his arms crossed. Hanada seemed to freeze at the shadowing of her father. She lowered her head before she started to go into the compound. Unknown to her, Naruto was walking with her. Hiyashi-sama, I apologize for Miss Hanada's tardiness. It was my fault that she is late, something happened at school which could not be avoided. Naruto apologized to the head of the Hyuga family. Hmm, this is fine. I hope that this does not happen again, Hiyashi replied, nodding in an understanding tone. Um, father. Can Naruto stay for dinner? Hinata asked quietly, but without a stutter. I see no problem in this. Naruto, would you like to train and stay for dinner? 
Hiyashi asked in an authoritative tone. Thank you for the offer, unfortunately I must decline as I have no other clothes with me. Naruto spoke in a respectful tone. Nonsense, I'm sure some of Neji's old clothing will fit just fine. Hiyashi insisted, it wasn't every day that he saw a person that got his daughter over her meekness. Turning to Hanada, he stood straight and slightly over her. Hanada, show him to the training area and change into your training outfit, Hiyashi told his daughter. Hiya. Hanada replied, her head down ever so slightly, she lead Naruto to the main family's training area where an already panting six-year-old girl was. The poor girl was out of breath and gasping hard. Hanabi. You have a five-minute break, then it's back to training. A voice behind Naruto told the young girl. Hia, to San. Hanabi replied, she then sat down and started to sip on the water that was next to her. Hiyashi stepped down into the training area, turning to Naruto he motioned for him to enter the area. Naruto removed his sandals and stepped onto the ground. A few moments later, the young blonde and the head of the Hayuga were standing across from one another. Naruto Uzumaki. Ahiyashi Hayuga would like to have a friendly spar. You may use what you wish to attack me, I will use the Juken style that we Hayuga use. Hiyashi explained to the blonde. Naruto nodded, before slipping into the dragon form. His right hand out in a clawed position and his left down at an angle. Hiyashi raised an eyebrow, never having seen that form before. Hatchling, he is way stronger than what he seems. You must defend only, if you have to try to use minimum use of the metal dragon form. Metalanaka told him. Naruto nodded, not only to inform his challenger that he was ready and inform Metal Knee that he would try to keep the MD form to a minimum use. Hiyashi and Naruto stared into each other's eyes. The tension in the training area so thick you could cut it with a kanai. A gentle breeze blew through the area, rustling the single tree that was there. One leaf was dislodged from the tree, and slowly floated to the ground. Both the fighters closed their eyes as the leaf became dislodged, when the leaf hit the ground both sets of eyes snapped open and the fight began. Hiyashi rushed forward and snapped some quick hits to Naruto's arms. Even with his Baikugan shut off, Hiyashi knew he hit the Tenketsu in his arms. Naruto slowly rubs his arms after picking himself up from the hit. Mema, Hiyashi-sama. You didn't have to go that far. Naruto ribbed the elder Hayuga. Naruto then started to channel chakra into his arms, slowly cloaking his hands in his wind element. Hiyashi was shocked nonetheless to see not only was Naruto still able to use chakra, he was pushing wind chakra out. The boy looked at the Hayuga's face and nodded. Hiyashi smirked and activated his Byakugan, seeing that it was pure wind chakra being pushed out of his hands and some on his feet. To give himself more agility, Hiyashi wondered. Again Hiyashi rushed forward snapping at Naruto's Tenketsus in his arms. Only to see that they once again did not close. Frowning slightly, he hit them again. Yet again, they did not close. Though he did see that when he went to hit the Tenketsus there seemed to be a small amount of chakra that covered them, almost like an invisible plating. After about ten minutes of sparing, Hiyashi stopped and nodded to Naruto. Who at this point was starting to perspire across the top of his forehead. I see that you have a unique ability. Naruto. Hiyashi commented as he went to the edge of the training area. I have no idea what you mean, Hayuga sama. Naruto defended himself. Oh, so you didn't have chakra covering your tenketsu when I struck your arms? May I see them? Hiyashi asked, more curious by the second. For Naruto, alarm bells were going off in his head. The same alarm bells that had saved him many times before. Naruto looked towards the way Hinata went after he was shown the training area. Hiyashi-sama, you must excuse me. I must check on Miss Hinata, I have a feeling that she is taking too long. Naruto excused himself, walking towards the back room. Noticing that one of the branch members was moving a bit too swiftly, almost as if they did not want to get caught. Hold it, where is Hinata? Naruto asked. The branch member rushed away. Naruto pushed wind chakra into his feet and pursues the branch member. The branch member rushed out of the compound and headed toward the western gate, with Naruto swiftly on his heels. Naruto caught up to the branch member right before they got to the gate. He pushed wind chakra into his hand and brushed the Achilles tendon on the left leg. The branch member tumbled as if they had suddenly fell over a log. More of the branch members landed next to their downed Hayuga. I'll ask again, what happened to Hinata? 
Naruto asked in a slightly rough voice. Unbeknownst to Naruto his eyes had started to turn into slits. The Hyuga Council. The branch member started. What about them? Naruto demanded, giving a look of complete seriousness. They forced me to attack Mistress Hanada. They wanted it to look like she had an accident. The branch member spilt, seeing that this child had not just kept up with them, but also inflicted damage that had crippled them, all without losing his breath. Where is she? Naruto asked, grabbing the Hyuga and lifting them up. Ga, her bedroom, main complex. The branch member gasped out, the killing intent suffocating them. Just like that Naruto was off again, this time returning back to the Hyuga complex. The guards positioned at the front of the complex saw a blonde dot one second, then the next it felt as if someone had used an A-ranked food and on them. Naruto threw open the door that was marked as Hinata's to see the young heiress on the ground. Naruto rushed to her side, to see that she was barely breathing. Naruto, use the healing jutsu that I taught you, it might be the only chance she has, Grandine told him. Naruto nodded and went through the hand seals for the jutsu, while he was going through the seals Hiyashi and Hanabi rushed into the room. Oni-san, what happened? What did you do? Hanabi tried to force the young blonde from her sister. Stop, I can save her. You have to trust me, it'll take a lot of my chakra, but it will heal all of her injuries. Naruto told them both as his eyes started to turn into slits and chakra started to flow around him. Grand Dragon Pulse. Naruto called out, slamming his hands onto Hinata. A giant pulse shot out from his hands and Hinata almost to the edge of the compound. The pulse then receded back to the point of origin and settled over Hinata. The pair stayed like that for about 10 seconds before Naruto slumped over. As he slumped over, Hinata sat up gasping for air. Hinata Onisan. You're okay, it worked. Naruto Onisan's jutsu worked. Hanabi excitedly proclaimed. Jutsu, what jutsu? What happened? Hanada asked, truly confused. All I remember coming into my bedroom and starting to get change. Then pain, and I couldn't hardly breath. The branch member I chased hit your lungs, but not as bad as it could have been, Naruto explained. Naruto kun. You saved me, Hanada asked, blushing slightly. I was just protecting a heim, Naruto confirmed, before slipping into unconsciousness. Well, I guess dinner with Naruto is postponed, Hiyashi said in a slightly happy tone, seeing that his eldest daughter who reminded him so much of his late wife was safe due to a yellow-haired knight. Minato, your son is going to do amazing things. Hiyashi thought to himself, he then steeled himself to face the Hyuga council. Knowing that before the night was out, he would have at least an inkling of wanting to massacre the council. It had been a few months after the attack on Hinata. The rumors had spread and the Hyuga clan had been humbled by the backroom whispering. Hiyashi saw that even in the upset of the clan that Hinata was becoming stronger and more confident in herself thanks to a certain blonde whiskered boy. The Hyuga incident was soon covered by the Uchiha massacre. Only three of the Uchihas left were Sasuke and Itachi, also their mother Makoto. Uchiha District, 8 p.m., 12 years after the Kyuubi attack. Itachi was out of the village, on an A-ranked mission. Sasuke and Makoto were out shopping and had noticed that it was getting late as they went home to start dinner. As they entered the Uchiha district, Makoto got a sense of dread. The district was quiet, to quiet espically around that time of the day. Normally children would be running around playing or you could hear people making dinner, doing laundry, or honing their ninja skills. It was as if all the noise had been sucked into a void and nothing was left, an unusual silence remained. Makoto pulled Sasuke next to her as they advanced into the district, her senses alert to the danger that was around them. As she turned a corner her eyes caught the image of a person or people cutting down one of the final clansmen, before they started to stalk up to the clan head's house. Sasuke, I need you to do something very important, I need you to run and grab the Hokage. If you see any Anbu send them straight here. Makoto told the young Uchiha. Sasuke looked confused but nodded and ran off toward the edge of the district toward the Hokage Tower. A blonde boy was yawning, coming back from one of the training grounds. There was a large claw mark on the back of his shirt, a leg of his pants had been torn to shreds, and an arm of his shirt had been clawed off. Geez, you would think that after about five years of training there, the wildlife would leave me alone. Nope, gotta try to pick on me every time I go there. 
Naruto complained to his tenants. Well, they only smell dragons and fox scent on you. They want to prove their superiority to you. Those fucking tigers though, that last one almost got your ass. Igneal commented snickering. Thanks to all the training that you guys have put me through, I'm much stronger than where I need to be. Hey, do you guys smell that? It smells like. Naruto started. Like blood. It's coming from the Uchiha district. Hatchling be careful, you just finished training. Grandine told the boy in a cautionary tone. I'll be fine Grand Nisan. I'll just take a quick peek and if I see someone still fighting. Then I provide support. I promise. Naruto told the wind dragon. I don't think he would be able to stop from fighting even if he wanted to. It's in a dragon slayer's blood to fight. Finding better and better enemies, almost like a calling. Metallicana explained. The rest nodding knowing that their human children had been like this except for Wendy, though she was just as destructive. Naruto applied wind chakra to his feet and jumped over the wall between the Uchiha district and the rest of the village. As he landed he quickly blended into the shadows and walked through the district. He noticed that an older Uchiha woman sent a boy that was with her, around his age back to get help. Then the woman went to the main clan house, almost as if stalking someone or something. Following her, Naruto kept to the shadows, watching her as she went into the house, after pulling a kanai from her sleeve. Naruto eased up against the house, almost making no noise. Suddenly a loud thud could be heard from the back of the house, as if someone got thrown hard into a wall. Kit, help her. Kayubi commanded. Naruto didn't need to be told as he was already springing into action. Jumping through a window, he came upon a man shadowed in a heavy cloak. The man was slicing down at the now wounded Makoto. Only to be stopped mid-swing as his sword clanged against a metal arm. The man followed the arm up to a blonde child, whose eyes were slitted with the edges starting to turn gold. Jumping back, the man got into a defensive stance. Not wanting to be caught he charged forward only to have the boy disappear and then reappear right next to where his sword slashed into the wall. Hmm, you have some skill boy. I wonder how long you can keep up, the man enticed. Well fucker, let's see. Naruto probed back at the man. Suddenly a flash illuminated from Naruto's left hand, blinding the man for a split second. Gah, little bastard. Where did you go? You can't hide for long, I'll find you. The man stated, sniffing the air. It took a few moments to find the scent, yet he was confused when he smelled the fox scent mixed with something he had been told of by his ancestors. The hunt begins. The man stated in an eager predatory voice. He started stalking the blonde boy. The man only had a few minutes until the specale forces of Kohanagakir showed up. That time frame would be more than enough for him to hunt and collect his kill from this prey. Naruto panted slightly, the strain from not only carrying Makoto but also using the new jutsu he had been working on, the toll was starting to work on him. Setting the black haired female down, he started to move back the way he came then split off to one of the Uchiha's private training grounds. He knelt and waited. His wait didn't last long as the man appeared on the other side of the training ground. I've found you my prey. The man told the young blonde, his prey. The man had never felt this effect before, he wanted to keep this hunt going. He wanted to make the hunt last longer, to feel the fear of his prey as it knew that its last moments were to be stalked like an animal. Yep, now that we are in the open. Let's play. Naruto told him in a cold tone. He then leapt at the man with speed that surprised the man for a moment. It was only due to the instinct that the man had built up over the years that he was able to dodge. The man's cloak on the other hand was now missing, the blonde had it in a clawed grip a few feet away. Tossing the cloak away, Naruto turned back to the man. Blocking a knife that had been aimed at his eye, a large knife with about 7 inches long and about 3 inches wide from the guard tapering to a point. Asterisk the blonde was taken back by the weapon. Jumping back as the man brought up another one in a reverse hold. Any help would be nice guys, Naruto exclaimed to his family. Use metal dragon form. It'll help protect you from the blade, the only problem would be your eyes, inner ears, and around your groin area will not be protected as much, Metallicana told him, pushing his power into the blonde. Where did this man come from, he had to be hired by someone, the rest of them thought, making note of how this man was wilding his knives. The man started to rush in again only for his mental warning bell to go off as a metal fist flew into his face. Dodging the fist, the man slashed up with his knife. 
The knife sliced through fabric and hit a resistance. Sparks flew off as the knife ground against something. Jumping back he took a new look at his prey, or what had been the blonde boy. Now standing before him was a figure completely covered in a gray flesh, looking more like a monster than a human. The figure covered in what could be described as a thin metal casing. Even his hair was glistening in the moonlight, throwing off a silvery hue. The figure's eyes were fully slitted and encompassed in gold with red mixed in. Interesting, let's try you out now, the man stated, his knives becoming red. Steam started to rise from the knives as the blades heated. Metal knee, how long can I use this form, and how much heat can it take? Naruto asked the metal dragon. At the state you are right now, maybe a few minutes. Temperature wise, maybe 1500 degrees. Metallicana informed the blonde. Judging by the color of his blades, it's around 1300 degrees. You'll be able to take the hit, but it'll hurt. Igniel chipped in. Naruto smiled, his blood started to boil. A voice other than his family sounded in his head, almost as if urging him. The calling flowed into him almost like a tidal wave was slamming into a shoreside cliff. Naruto launched himself at the man, dodging the heated metal, clawing the man up the chest heading to his face. The man slid back, the clawed hand missing the majority of his face by a few centimeters, his nose was not as lucky as a small chunk was taken out of the tip. The man slashed up, craving a smoking cut on the arm. The wound sealed as it was cut from the heat. Ignoring the pain Naruto jumped back, doing a few hand signs then taking a deep breath. Hatchling, don't. You don't know if your lungs can take the force, Grandine yelled, feeling her power being pulled to the child. Naruto suddenly blew a large gust out, dragon slayer art, wind dragon breath. Naruto yelled as he blew. The force of the gust blew sticks and leaves into the trees behind the man, making them embed themselves into the trees. A few of the trees were uprooted and thrown back. The man was sent back a few feet due to the force of the wind. My prey is becoming more and more interesting. For giving me this entertaining show I'll tell you my name, seeing we are short on time. Just remember it is the person that will kill you one day. My name is Naito Hanta. I will leave you with that memento on your arm become stronger so that we can have a more interesting battle. Naito informed the blonde, turned and walked away as the blonde fell forward. Naruto tried to force himself to his knees, only to fail. His lungs felt like they were on fire, an intense burning running through them. Gasping for breath, he finally passed out, from the strain of the MDF and the use of the DSA. Wind Dragon Breath Three minutes later, Uchiha training grounds several Anbu appeared with the Hokage. The carnage that laid before them was in short crazy. It looked as if a F3 sized tornado had went through and destroyed part of the training grounds. The point of origin was stemmed from a young boy who was unconscious on the ground, the blonde hair now having light gray and white mixing into his hair. Hokage, what? A hawk masked Anbu started. Bear, tiger. Go see if any of the Uchiha are still alive. Snake take Naruto to the hospital. Serutobi commanded. Two of the Anbu disappeared. The third grabbed the young blonde and disappeared, heading towards the hospital. We need to find out who attacked us and how they got in. I want Inazaka here now, the cloak will have the person sent. The Hokage told Hawk. Hawk nodded and disappeared, going to fetch the trackers. Naruto, just how strong will you become? Serutobi thought to himself as he viewed the aftermath of the short skirmish that had happened here. Kanahakagir Hospital. I see you, room 205. Naruto was laying in the hospital bed, replaying the fight in his head again and again. It was a day after the incident. The Hokage had come in and informed him that the man named Naito had escaped. After about 10 miles, the scent just disappeared as if there never was a man. Naruto knew better, the feeling of him being hunted still fresh in his mind. He knew that feeling all too well, due to him training in the forest of death and being hunted by its residents. Naruto looked at his arm a bright red scar could be seen where Naito's knife had carved into his flesh. He would have to spend a few weeks getting used to the addition to his body, it wasn't anything new. There was a knock at the door, then the door opened to show a group of people that had come to visit. Kiba was the first complaining how his friend, rival had been beat before he could do it. Shikamaru and Choji came in after Kiba, making a beeline to the other bed to sit on making sure that their friend was comfortable and set food on the bedside table. Shino appeared next, 
nodding to Naruto, who returned the nod. Finally a nervous Hinata entered, trying to stay next to the wall, as she was still not used to large groups. Guys, I'm fine. I'll be out of here in a few days. Naruto informed them, laughing and using the mask he had been forced to wear every day to hide his true emotions. Naruto had slid his scarred arm under the sheets before they had entered. Naruto, IBB brought some healing salve. It SS should help with your recovery, Hinata told the blonde, handing him a jar of green salve. Thanks Haim, but you didn't have to do that. I was just in the wrong place and time. Naruto told the blunette, smiling softly and squeezed her hand. Which caused the Hyuga to blush lightly. So what happened Naruto? Kiba asked, wanting all the details. I can't tell you. Even if I wanted to, it's an ranked secret. Naruto told the dog boy. We saw Sasuke at school, he was completely destroyed by the fact only his mother, elder brother and him are the only Uchiha's left. Shikamaru told the blonde. Naruto nodded, knowing that the brain of Shikamaru was working overtime, trying to find out what the blonde was hiding. The friend's visitation was cut short as there was another knock at the door and two people entered into the room. One was Itachi Uchiha and the other was Makoto, the latter still bandaged slightly. Excuse me, is this the room of Uzumaki Naruto? Itachi asked cautiously. Hey guys, I'll see ya at school. Bye. Naruto told his friends as they all left, before turning back to the two Uchihas. How may I help you Uchiha-sama? Naruto asked formally. Nay, I don't like titles that much, Itachi-san will be fine. This is my mother Makoto. Who you saved last night? Itachi told Naruto. He then suddenly got on his knees, his mother following suit and they both bowed deeply. We would like to thank you for stopping the man before he ended the Uchiha line. I would also like to thank you for saving my mother and younger brother from a horrible fate. Itachi told the blonde. Hey, you don't have to bow to me, I just did my duty to the village. I mean what kind of person would I be if I let allies be slaughtered? Naruto told them, his voice full of compassion. Itachi got up from the floor and walked up to Naruto, gripping his shoulder gently. Naruto winched from the pain as his scar throbbed slightly. May I see your arm Naruto? Itachi asked, not missing the flinch when he had grabbed the boy's shoulder. Naruto sighed, before pulling his arm out from under the sheet. The bright red scar burned slightly when introduced to the cool hospital air. Itachi looked at the scar with slight curiosity. Naruto, I have been informed by the Hokage that you have interesting affinities. A large fire affinity, if you wish we would like to teach you a few Kaden Jutsus. This would be the beginning of payment for what you have done for us. Also my personal promise that if we are ever battling together I will place your life above my own, Itachi told the boy. Makoto gasped, the Jutsus she understood. What Itachi had told the boy, was that he was offering a death bond. If the boy would accept, then when they would be paired in a unit. No matter the mission, Itachi would sacrifice himself for the boy. No I know what you are promising Itachi-san. I will not take your promise, you have a life to live. I would not wish for you to become a sacrifice on my behalf. I would like you to help Sasuke grow and develop so that he will not tread on to the path of revenge. Naruto told the older Uchiha, his voice serious. For a moment Itachi saw the Yandaimi Hokage before him. Itachi seeing truth in these words nodded and turned to leave. Makoto walked up to her savior and gently kissed his cheek. You are always welcome to the Uchiha house anytime you want. Makoto told the blonde in a loving tone, almost like a mother praising her child. Naruto smiled and nodded at her. With that the Uchihas left the room. Naruto laid back, exhausted from the people visiting him. His lungs still burned from his use of the DSA. The doctors were surprised that his lungs had not imploded from the force of the use of such a food and jutsu. There was some scarring, but it would heal over time. Naruto closed his eyes, opening them again he found himself on the rocky plateau staring up from the ground at the sky. You my hatchling are an idiot, a voice told him from above as Igneal stood over him. You know what I genie, shove it, I want to relax, Naruto retorted to the fire dragon. Igneal smirked predatory before slamming his fist down where Naruto's head was. Seeing the fist, Naruto rolled and jumped up. He dodged again as a kick came from behind, this time from Grandine. We warned you about the effects that could happen. You are lucky that you didn't die from the force on your lungs. 
Grandine scolded the blonde. Naruto dodged again as another fist missed his face, he then backflipped as an axe kick came down from above. These courtesy of both Skiadrum and Wysolohia. What the hell? Can you guys not team up on me right now? Naruto asked, in a no-nonsense tone. What if Naito had killed you, huh? Metallicana asked, using a dual hammer fist. Slamming it into the ground Naruto had been moments before. You'll face stronger foes, and Naito will also be stronger. He was toying with you, you heard what he said. Kayubi told the blonde, kicking at his head. Naruto froze, sensing truth in her words. Naruto took the brunt of the attack and slammed into the mountain face. You don't think I know that, Naruto yelled back, suddenly trying holding back tears and failing. You don't think I thought how all of you would feel. How the people that care about me would feel. How it was to be weak, the thought that I might not be alive in moments. Naruto suddenly fell to his knees, crying. The males of the group stood waiting, the two females held Naruto. Naruto cried, yelled, and finally pulled himself together. The sobs slowed, and then finally stopped. Wiping the tears away, Naruto stood, looking at his family, who were waiting for something from the young man. I promise. Naruto started, I promise, not to let you down. I will get stronger, not just for myself though. For the people I love, the ones that also love me, I will get stronger so that I can protect them. Naruto finished, gripping his fist. The bracelet on his arm started to glow, it changed from a black hue to a misty gray. Naruto looked at the bracelet, wondering what had happened. Huh, it looks like we can take the training up a notch now. Igneal commented, smirking. What? What happened? Naruto asked, completely lost on the moment. You have achieved in accessing the next stage. Now you can start learning the dragon slaying arts. Metaliansa informed him, smiling predatory. Grandine smiled gently with love and pride. Skiadrum and Wysolohia smirked with pride seeing their adopted brother take a step into becoming stronger. Kayubi smiled, seeing her kid become stronger and knowing that he would be a force to be reckoned with. Well, we'll get started as soon as I heal fully. Naruto told them. The group nodded, and with that Naruto fell asleep the events of the last couple of days pushing him to his limits. Friday October 10, 13 years after Kayubi, Naruto's apartment. Naruto had just came back from his training, wanting nothing but to shower and rest. Unfortunately that was not to be as a knock came from his front door. Pulling a kanai, Naruto placed himself on the edge of the doorframe. Who is it? Naruto asked, knowing that tonight was one of the worst nights for him which usually ended him up in the hospital or hiding in the forest of death. Naruto, it's Hanada and Hanabi. Can we come in? A voice on the other side of the door asked. Putting the kanai away, Naruto opened the door to see not only Hanada and Hanabi, but Kiba, Shino, Shikamaru, Choji, Makoto, Itachi, Sasuke, and a dark-haired woman with red eyes and an ample bust dressed in a form-fitting dress made of what looked like ribbons, and finally next to that woman was another dressed in a mesh bodysuit with a tan trench coat and orange mid-thigh long skirt, her legs covered by large shin guards. Her hair was in a ponytail that stood in the back. Hey guys, um. Sorry for the mess, come in and sit down. I'll be back in a few minutes. Naruto told them as he led his guests into his small apartment, he headed into his bedroom and went to change. As he reappeared a few minutes later, after taking a quick shower and changed into more comfortable clothing, he was surprised to see a pile of gifts and some food on his table. What is all this? Naruto wondered, knowing that today was his birthday, but due to the years of abuse and hurt from the villagers, he had never been able to celebrate it. It's your birthday party, silly. Makoto confirmed what Naruto had been thinking. You mean? Naruto started to ask. Yes, Naruto. This is for you. Itachi told him, guiding him to the living room where his friends were eating and talking. But what about? Naruto started again as he was forced to sit on the lumpy couch. If the villagers are stupid enough to come tonight with two Jonin level and two Anbu leveled ninjas here, then they deserve the effects of trying anything while we are here. Itachi consoled the young blonde, smiling. So enjoy the festivites, and have fun. It's not every day you turn 13. Hey Nai Chan, you said there would be sake and dango here. Such a party pooper. The meshed covered woman complained. Anko, Hanada asked me to come. Not only as a family friend, but as a person. 
Seeing as you helped Naruto out so much when he was younger, I thought you might want to meet him without being in Anbu mode. Kuranai told Anko. Plus if you behave, we'll go hit the bars after. Okay. Anko nodded, more than content to watch her ward have at least one happy birthday in his life. It still made her angry remembering all the scenes that she had witnessed due to this innocent boy, all of them ending with her taking the boy to the hospital. An exception for the last few years, she had started to notice that no matter what happened to the boy he would not fight back. He showed compassion and love to the people of the village, even after a night of being beat. She started to feel something after years of watching after him, something that she was not able to pin down. Naruto watched as presents were set before him, and then the lights went off. Panicking, thinking that the villagers had shut off his power, he went to draw a kanai. Suddenly, everyone started to sing, Happy Birthday. Makoto and Hinata came from the kitchen holding a cake with 13 candles on it. Placing the cake in front of Naruto, they all waited for the boy to blow out his candles. Moments went by, and they watched as tears started to form in the teenager's eyes. Silently the tears started to pour from his eyes and land on the table. Naruto? Are you okay? Makoto asked worriedly, over the last couple of months she had started to see this young man as one of her own sons. Even Sasuke had started to accept him as a brother, training with him when the blonde came around. The boy just cried as he looked at the group of people were there, not to harm him, but to celebrate his birthday with him. Hanada went around coffee table and sat down next to him, she then hugged the teenager. Naruto felt this and enjoyed the embrace from his friend. After a few more moments the tears slowed and finally stopped. Naruto looked at the cake, it had a comical looking fox on it and in cursive writing, Happy 13th, Naruto, was written on it. Thank you. You don't know how much this means to me. I'm sorry for crying. Let's eat. Naruto explained, blowing out the candles. The lights turned on as Makoto started to cut the cake for everyone. Karinia and Anko grabbed the presents and started to hand them to Naruto. Naruto opened the gifts. The gifts consisted of a new set of kanai and shuriken, a scroll of AC ranked jutsu, a new shogi set, all natural bug repellent, a waiver for Ichiraku ramen. After Naruto had opened his last present, Hanada stepped forward, looking at Hanada, he waited. Hanada and Hanabi handed the last gift to him, he opened the gift to see that it contained clothes. Ah, Haim. I thought I meant more to you than that. Naruto teased the blue net. Naruto Nissan, these are chakra enhanced clothes with sealed pockets. Hanabi scolded the blonde for teasing her sister. A hey, actually Naruto there is one more gift. Hanada told the boy, nervously poking her index fingers together. Okay. Naruto asked, looking around looking for a box they missed. Suddenly his face was whipped to the front. Hanada stared at him with all seriousness. Then what happened next surprised everyone, Naruto the most. Hanada went forward and kissed him hard in a step of courage for her. The room was deathly quiet as the kiss went for a few seconds. Finally Hanada released Naruto. Hanada eeped at what she had just done, turned a bright red and promptly fainted onto him. Naruto just sat there with a surprised look on his face, a light blush forming. Wow, I didn't like Hanada would give you a gift like that. Lucky little shit. Anko said, laughing at the scene. Anko chan, that's not funny. Do you know how hard it was for Hanada to do that? But Itachi, you owe me my bet. Karinia told the older Uchiha male. Hi, hi. Itachi said as he gave her the money. Suddenly there was a knock at the door, Itachi got up and opened it. A group of villagers were there, the one that had knocked was red from liquor and slashed down with a knife as the door opened. The knife suddenly disappeared only to be found against its owner's throat. May I help you? Itachi asked, his sherigan flashing and starting to spin lazily. The question had attracted the attention of the other three ninja in the room along with everybody else other than the dazed teenagers on the couch. We've come for the duh, one of the more drunk villagers started to say, only to be found pinned to the wall opposite the door by a hand full of snakes. What you have come for is a one-way trip to the Kahonagor torture and interrogation center. And trying to ruin a 13-year-old's birthday party, for shame. Anko stated next to the pinned villager, as she shook her head. We'll gladly show you the way, Karinia told them, as she appeared to the left of the group. If not, well you don't have a choice. Makoto finished, as she finished the boxing formation. Itachi had closed the door by this time, 
so the teenagers would not see the group of angry drunks. Naruto and Hinata had come around when they heard the door close. Ah shit. One day, is it too much to ask? Naruto asked out loud. What are you talking about Naruto? The adults went out to get some air. Kiba stated, not reading the vibes in the room. It's nothing Kiba. Let's just clean up so you guys can head home. Naruto informed his friends. Shikamaru studied his blonde friend, seeing the nervousness from when they came in to the subtle hints that he had seen over the night. It was something about today that had set the teen off. He would have to investigate this later. A few minutes later the rest of the teens had left, the adults appearing as the group finished cleaning up. Hanada was the last out the door, Hanabi and Kuranai waiting at the end of the outside hallway. Naruto grabbed her hand, turning her back to him. Hanada Haim, I would like to thank you for the last gift. May I take you out on a date sometime? Naruto asked the Hayuga. Hanada, eeped, again, and blushed a little. Hi, I would like that. Hanada replied, forcing herself not to faint again in front of her crush. Naruto smiled, releasing her hand bid her good night and closed the door after Hinata had left. Sighing he placed his head on the door. Turning around he went to his window and climbed onto the roof, he laid down and watched as the clouds drifted across the moon and stars. Well that was an interesting party, a voice called out from the dark. Hubby, took you long enough to come say hi. I'm surprised you didn't say anything earlier, Naruto told the woman. I didn't want to spoil the moment with your little girlfriend, Anko explained to Naruto, sitting down beside him with a sake bottle. You did promise me that we would go have some fun later. Anko slid up against the blonde, rubbing against him. Naruto blushed gently, the feeling of Anko's breast rubbing against his arm. I've told you Anko, I'm too young to do stuff like that, Naruto told her, standing up. Naruto. Earlier when you were throwing those tigers around in the forest, like they were naughty kittens was a real turn on. Even I have trouble with them, and I live in that forest. Anko commented, pushing buttons to get something out of the blonde. Anko, I know you like to be subjugated, I know it's a big turn on for you to be forced. Just not yet, you know how my life is. How the villagers treat me, even tonight. When I was surrounded by the ones I care about. Naruto explained trying to hide his face from the snake mistress. Naruto, let me see your eyes, let me see what you won't let Hinata chan see. Anko begged, knowing that they both needed it. They had made an agreement years ago, when he started training in the forest of death. Forest of death, four years ago Naruto landed the last hit a bear who had tried to claw him. The bear was out cold, but not hurt to bad. He turned and started walking toward the entrance of the forest. Suddenly a kanai flashed in front of him. Naruto jumped back, sensing for danger. Another kanai flew past, nicking his cheek. Suddenly he tensed up as a pair of arms wrapped around him. So Gaki, why are you in my forest, playing with my toys? The voice asked behind him. A tonuge licked his cheek where the kanai had nicked him. I didn't know that this forest belonged to anyone. As for your toys, the bear started it. Naruto explained tense from the sudden intrusion of space. Ah, well Gaki, why would you hurt him if he wanted to play? The voice asked. I don't know Habi, why do you watch me every time I come here? Naruto questioned back. The arms suddenly let go, the woman suddenly appeared in front of Naruto. Smirking she retrieved her kanai. Sue, why do you hide behind your mask? Can I see what you are trying to hide? Enko asked, curiosity getting to her. Naruto was surprised, only Serutobi had seen him without his mask on once. The pain and suffering that had built up over the years, even after he found a family that loved him for himself. I will, only if you remove yours also. Naruto stated, he had noticed this also when he had sensed the woman watching him. The pain and suffering, not to the degree his was, though close enough. Let's make a deal then. We'll both remove our masks and show the true self to each other. Anko told him. Naruto thought about this for a moment then nodded. They stared into each other's eyes, both flooded with pain and suffering and anguish. Both also with want and the fear of being alone. Let's do this again, it's nice to be around someone who knows what you feel. Anko told him. Even my best friend, can barely see through my mask. It was nice to find someone that's on the same level as I am. I'll be back next weekend, try not to let our, toys, 
get to a head. Naruto asked the snake woman. Oh, that's on them. Anko replied, I train with them all the time. It's much more fun than with other people. People are so boring. With that the two outcasts went their separate ways, meeting up every few weeks to remove their masks or just to hang out. Naruto's apartment, present day Naruto sighed, even though it helped. It hurt every time he removed his mask, he also felt relief. He cherished these moments, the kindred spirits of pained ones seeing the truth of each other. Naruto looked at Anko, both of them took a breath and let the masks drop. The intensity of pain grew between the pair. Soon their faces were a breath away from each other. Their lips, so close that their breaths danced on the cold wind of autumn together, like two people dancing to a silent song. Naruto was the first to snap back to reality, he pushed himself away from the situation that was starting to bloom. Thank you Anko, I needed that after tonight. Those stupid villagers, trying to ruin a wonderful night I had. Naruto explained, the blonde stood up and looked out at the village. Anytime Naruto. Anko replied, sadly hoping that they could have took the next step. Naruto wouldn't until he was ready both emotionally and mentally. She knew that he needed to grow a little more before that could happen. The kiss from Hinata had shaken him more than they all realized. Good night hubby Haim, I'll see ya tomorrow. Naruto told Anko in a melancholy tone, his mask still slightly off, with that the blonde headed inside. Sighing, Anko pushed herself up and jumped off the roof, knowing that she had new playthings in the IT department waiting for her. Inside Naruto laid in his bed, drifting into the sweet abyss of sleep. His mind flashed back to the kiss with Hinata the softness of her lips, the love emitating from her. Naruto also felt the same feeling from Anko just moments ago. He had always was able been to sense the emotions of people, on times it had saved his life Mudipule times. Can I actually be loved? Naruto asked himself, before he was embraced by the abyss of nothingness. In Naruto's mindscape, his family had watched and felt his emotions turn into a roller coaster. He needs to find his mind set before he can take the next step, Igniel stated. Yeah, but unless Kami is gonna make a miracle happen, then one, if not all three of them will have their hearts broken, Grandine remarked. Realm of the Gods Kami sneezed, and the chess set shook ever so slightly. What the hell Kami, if you caught a cold in that thin bed sheet, you call a dress, then you better not let either one of us catch it, Yami complained, as she grabbed a cookie and took a sip from her goblet. The pieces on the board settled as the game continued. Yami would never say anything, but she was enjoying this round of chess. Council Room, Midnight, Kohanakagor, so from the reports that were written on the Uchiha Massacre, we now see that young Uzumaki has a unique skill set. Almost, bloodline-like. As far as we have seen, this, bloodline, could be useful. One of the smarter civilian council members stated. Yes. But if you think that young Naruto will want to whore himself out to any woman you want, I might want you to think again, Sarutobi answered. I, myself will not be taking part in this vote as he saved me from dying a few months ago. Makoto informed the council, on another note. My sons, nor myself will be under the CRA, that is my final judgment. I also will not vote, due to the situation that he is my son's friend, Choza informed the council. Shika raised his head and held up a thumbs down, showing that he would not vote either. My daughter is also infatuated with Uzumaki-san. I will also have to decline my vote, Hiyashi voiced. With that we'll take a vote to see if Naruto Uzumaki will be placed under the CRA, Sarutobi stated. With a show of hands, Sarutobi sighed and rubbed his forehead, sensing that this would be the longest years of his life in the near future. Naruto might either hug me, Chew me out, or kill me for this. Sarutobi thought to himself as he dismissed the council. Land of Lightning, October 11th, unknown location The cave was nothing of importance, no one entered it, it was just another hole. It was this cave that Naito watched. Sensing power that was sealed, his ancestors had been tasked with keeping this place safe until the time was right. Naito sensed that something was happening in the back of the cave, a shift of power. At the back of the cave the wall suddenly cracked and crumbled showing a door. If one would open this door they would find a room lined with coffins in them. The markings show on the coffins would be nothing one of the present people could read. Several of the coffins were marked, the symbols worn away due to time. 
One of the coffins opened up with a hiss. A large man with bright yellow hair stepped out, cracking his neck. OWWW, being stuck in that thing put a creak in my neck. I wish someone else was awake, I need a warm up, the man stated to himself. He watched the coffins, out of all of them only one interested him, one that had no markings on it, this one was colored in a midnight black stone. Looking at the other coffins the man sighed, I guess I'll have to sit and wait for the rest to wake up, so boring. Academy Years PRT3 Kohanagakir, 15 year after Kyubi incident, Shinobi Academy. Finally it was here, the day before graduation day. The next day they could be called a shinobi. Several of these children were bored, waiting for the day to end. No more than a white and silvered blonde haired teen. For what seemed like the umpteenth time Naruto sighed, he was never one for really sitting and waiting, Uruka's final lesson was boring him to death. Naruto looked and saw that Uruka was not really paying attention to his class, focusing more on the chalkboard. Hey, which do you guys think I should try in the class's time frame? Delta Indigo, or Alpha Alpha? Naruto asked his family. If we put it to a vote, then it would have to be Zeta Zulu. Kayubi replied, being the one that had produced the idea for Zeta Zulu. Zeta Zulu would have a nice effect on the rest of the village. The problem is that, Zeta Zulu is a double edged prank. We have no idea how the villagers or shinobi would take it, Skiadrum commented. I think Kayubi is right, if this is our last day before we become shinobi, then we need to go out with a bang. Naruto told the group. With that, Naruto simply vanished from the classroom. Hanada saw Naruto walk past, knowing what her boyfriend would be going to do. She smiled as she focused on Uruka's lecture. Really, Naru kun, are you really going to try Zeta Zulu? Just be careful. The Hyuga heir thought to herself, waiting for the surprise that was to happen. Sure enough, about 10 minutes later, a Janin rushed in. Uruka, where is Naruto Uzumaki? The Janin asked, voiced in agitation. Well, he's right. Uruka started as he pointed to Naruto's desk, finally noticing he was missing and that three fourths of his class were promptly passed out. Hanada, when did he leave? Uruka asked the questioned blonde's girlfriend. About Elev, no, 12 minutes ago. Hanada replied with a slight smile, after years of being around Naruto, her stutter was almost fully gone. It returned if she was extremely nervous or embarrassed. Really? Why didn't you say anything? Uruka inquired. If my boyfriend wants to leave the academy in a show of wonderment, who am I to stop him from doing it? Hanada replied, showing a little bit of mischievousness that had rubbed onto her from Naruto. What has he done now? Uruka wondered. Hanada smiled broadly, Zeta Zulu. With those two words, Uruka palmed his face hard. Then the weirdest thing started to happen, Uruka started to chuckle. The chuckle turned into a snort, then laughter came gushing out. I was wondering when he would pull Zeta Zulu. I'm surprised it took him this long, Uruka said, finally coming off his laughing high. With Naruto, Hokage Monument Naruto stood waiting for the presence of the Kohanakagor Anbu. You guys are five minutes late, Naruto commented as the people he had been waiting on appeared behind him. Turning he only saw three Anbu standing behind him. Bear, Tiger, and Hawk were in defensive stances waiting for something to happen. Only three, I was hoping for at least a squadron to be here. Naruto informed the three Anbu. So, Naruto. Which plan is this one? Hawk asked as he eased himself forward with caution. Naruto produced a shit-eating grin before he turned back around and started walking to the edge of the monument. He then looked over his shoulder as he took the final step. Zeta Zulu. Naruto stated, then dropped off the Hokage monument. Shit, I thought that was a legend, Bear told Hawk. It was supposed to be. Get him before he dies, Hawk commanded Bear, who jumped after the blonde. What's Zeta Zulu? Tiger asked. I forgot, you just started yesterday. Zeta Zulu is the highest rank ever on the Naruto prank scale. It was only supposed to be a myth, a legend. Yet Naruto went and did it. And if he told us we were late and had to few people, well then, we seriously did not think this through. Hawk explained to Tiger as he followed suit of Bear. You still haven't told me what the prank is, Tiger yelled as he jumped after Hawk. You'll see as we follow him. Hawk yelled back, smiling under his mask. For years Naruto had a fun hate relationship with the Anbu. 
It started with a harmless prank of coloring the ANBU's masks, in which the Anbu retaliated and started hunting Naruto down. The pranks then started to escalate as time passed, the day would one day come for a final showdown between the elite shinobi and the king of pranks. As harmless as the pranks were, a rumor was started by who nobody knew, of a final prank, of a prank called Zeta Zulu. The Naruto prank scale had 26 levels, Alpha Zeta. In that scale there was another scale on the severity of the main prank, Alpha Zulu. So simply put Zeta Zulu was the worst prank ever, it was the code for pranking the entire of Kahonig here. In other words, nobody was safe from the prankster king. With Naruto, moments after falling Naruto enjoyed the rush of wind on his face as he plummeted off the monument. He felt the presence of one Anbu falling after him. He turned in mid-flight to see that it was only bear, followed moments later by hawk then tiger. Smirking, he threw a small white ball up. Quickly he chan led wind chakra into his arms and legs, slowing his descent. Naruto gently landed on top of the Hokage's office, he looked up to see the beginning of Zeta Zulu. The Shodai Hokage face was covered in what looked like branches and shrubbery, making him look more like a tree dweller rather than the founder of the village. Next, the Nidame looked to have a fish face and had tears running down his face. Turning he faced the face of the Sandame Hokage, which looked like a perverted monkey with blood dripping from his nose. Finally the Yandaimi was colored to look like a toad with an attitude, an air of seriousness mixed with comedy. Suddenly the three Anbu that had cornered him on the monument landed in front of him. Their Anbu uniforms multicolored, looking as if they fell through a rainbow. We got you now Naruto. Hawk stated, feeling a slight pity that their game of cat and mouse was coming to an end. Gotta catch me first. Naruto replied, as a ball of light exploded from his hand outwards. Temporarily blinded Hawk reached forward to grab the blonde feeling a pull of resistance he slapped a chakra sealant tag on the person. What the fuck? A voice responded. Who is that? Hawk asked, still blinded. It's Tiger, you stupid motherfucker, Tiger retorted. Damn it. He got away. Hawk informed the team. Hawk then pressed the button on his comm link. Warning to all Anbu, Zeta Zulu is in effect. I repeat, Zeta Zulu is in effect. Hawk spoke over the comm link. The only thing that was heard over the radio was, fuck me, from multipule voices. Then suddenly another voice could be heard over the comm link. This one was from a pre-recording that had been set up beforehand. To all Anbu, you have a countdown of two minutes till the next event is to take place. To stop the event, you'll have to catch me. Good luck, and may the odds be ever in my favor. Naruto Uzumaki, Prank King of Kohanakagor. The message informed them. Fucker hacked the comm link. How the hell did he do that? Tiger asked. Dude, we're talking about Naruto Uzumaki. Really want to figure that out? Bear asked him. On second thought, no I don't. Tiger replied after thinking for a moment. Target sighted, heading into the market district. A voice replied over the comm link. Sure enough, a large cloud of smoke could be seen in the market district. It originated from the second best shinobi weapons shop. A man looked out his shop door to see that his competitor had been Naruto'd. Smiling, he was glad that he had treated the boy with kindness. With seeing the shop across from him being pranked, decided that it was a good time to close the shop for the rest of the day. Uchiha compound Itachi Uchiha was pulling on his Anbu gear, readying himself for work. He turned on his comm link to hear, Zeta Zulu is in effect. Upon hearing that, Itachi promptly took off his Anbu gear placing it back in the dresser. He then went to lock and bolt all the openings into the house. It feels like a good day to do nothing, Itachi told himself as he sat down, only to hear a squishing noise. Looking down he saw that he had sat down in quick setting rubber cement. Well fuck, Itachi said as he realized he had just been Naruto'd. Akamichi Barbecue Restaurant. What do you mean all the barbecue sauce was switched with quadruple flame hot sauce? Choza asked his sous chef. When the second shift came in, all the barbecue had been switched out. The sous chef explained. Not only that, all the sinks have been clogged and or removed. Dear Kami, it's Zeta Zulu. Choza explained, a sense of dread coming over the plump shinobi. What do we do? The sous chef asked worried for his own safety, let alone anyone else. We close the shop. What else can we do until this maelstrom has passed? Choza calmly told his second. 
I would also like you to inform anyone that had been mean or disrespectful to Naruto to pray, really hard. Nara resident, Nara deer farm it was a disaster at the deer farm. Not only had the deer got outside the pens and started to stampede, but all the stags were dressed up like a red-nosed reindeer. Eight of the deer had been set to a sleigh and a figurine wearing a red outfit lined with white fluff could be seen sitting in the back. A speaker set was in the sleigh playing numerous songs relating to snow, chestnuts, and a thing called Christmas. Needless to say it was going to be an entertaining day for the Nara as they scrambled to catch and place the deer back into the pens. Years after Zeta Zulu, the Nara clan could still be heard whistling a tune that sounded like a song that had been played that day. Kohanakagor Hot Springs Dog had been following Naruto at a quick pace, almost catching him several times, only to find himself trapped in a wire net as they entered the Hot Springs district. Attached to the said net was a note that read, Enjoy the kisses. Feeling the dampness from the springs, Dog realized that both his Anbu mask and his face mask were missing. Dog looked up to see a group of women smiling at him, a hungry predatory look in their eyes. Naruto, were the last words that were heard before he was set upon. Hokage's office Serutobi had been laughing at what Naruto had done to the monument. Then the emergency call had came over the comm link, I repeat Zeta Zulu is in effect. Upon hearing that, Serutobi hit the safe room button his office becoming a personalized bunker. Settling back to catch up on some reading, he pulled out his book. Opening it, his eyes became large and horrified. Running to his secret stash of books, he started to go through them. Only to be more horrified at each book. The book that had been left on the desk showed only Yaoi-themed scenes. Each book had been replaced with its Yaoi counterpart. The Hokage was found a few hours later, sitting in a shivering pile with a white wisp floating out of his mouth. Forest of Death Naruto settled down and opened a scroll, his back against a large chuffing tiger, who was calmly sunning itself. He figured that he had at least a couple of hours before they tried the forest, and he had decided to work out a seal for the reverse summoning of his family. A large crashing noise could be heard from the other side of the forest, and it was fast approaching the blonde. Suddenly a large grey-coloured snake appeared, its head easily the size of an academy classroom. Sitting on top of the snake's head was a very pissed off Anko. Why? The only question that was asked as the snake poised to strike. Zeta Zulu, all bets were off, Naruto replied calmly as he read through his scroll. The tiger looked up and at that moment decided that a clearing on the other side of the forest was better or a cave would be an even wiser idea. As the aura that was imitating from the snake mistress was anything to go on. Sweetheart. I think that the Gaki needs to have a lesson taught to him, sick him, Enko told the snake. With that the snake struck. Naruto abandoned his sitting spot, narrowly dodging the attack. Geez Enko, it was a harmless prank, don't get your panties in a twist. What's wrong, you don't have any prisoners to get off on? Naruto asked in a mocking tone. No, Enko replied in a serious tone. I can deal with a lot of things, hell I'll even help you set some pranks up. But when you take my dango stash and replace it with instant ramen, like you said not moments ago, all bets are off. Well, it was funny while it lasted, Naruto stated, laughing at the snake mistress. Dodging another strike from the snake, the blonde thought it might be a good idea to leave while the leaving was good. Get back here, I ain't done with you yet, Anko yelled after the fleeing teenager. Oh, bite me, Habiheim. Naruto yelled back, Hold still and I will. Enko replied as the snake went in again. I didn't mean literally, you crazy sadistic bitch, Naruto exclaimed, fleeing from the serpent's onslaught. Sounds of crashing, explosions, and a several strings of cursing could be heard for hours later. Naruto's apartment, night time after the light exorcist from Enko, Naruto was tired. After a quick shower and a change of clothes, he ventured into his kitchen, hungry from the day's activities. Opening his cabinet where his, after pranking, ramen was stored, Naruto froze. He rushed to his emergency ramen cabinet, he turned horrified to the fridge, hoping, no praying that there was something in it other than the monstrosities that were offered in his sacred places. Gulping loudly, he slowly opened the refrigerator. After staring at the horror that was before his sight, Naruto fainted, foam forming around his mouth. If one was to enter Naruto's apartment, they would find the blonde passed out in the middle of the kitchen. 
The cabinets opened to show only cans of nothing but turnip greens. The fridge only contained fresh turnip greens. A small note could be found on the first shelf in the fridge, saying, You've been hanotted, with a chibi hanada blowing a kiss. After that day, it was known that even though Naruto was labeled as the king of pranks, a rumor had started of another person that had even pranked the king, they were labeled as the kami of pranks. Nobody knew who had pranked the king as all evidence had been removed. The only person that knew of the identity of the person was the king of pranks, and his lips were sealed. Shinobi Academy, a few days after Zeta Zulu due to what was now to be named, Double Z Day, Aftermath, the graduation exam had been set back a few days. Naruto sat with Hinata, holding hands and both of them silently praying for a miracle. Hinata Hayuga please come in. Uruka called as a student left the empty classroom. Good luck, Hina Haim. Naruto wished, kissing her cheek. Hinata blushed gently from the catcalls she got from the girls in the class. Thank you Naru-kun. Promise me even if either of us fail that we'll still have our anniversary date. Hinata looked at him. I promise. It'll be a night for you to remember, Naruto told the brunette. Watching Hinata go into the unknown was frightening for Naruto. She had been there for him emotionally for the last few years. Feeling the fear of not being in her presence was starting to drown the teen. Especially when Serutobi had dropped the CRA bomb on him. Needless to say, so far only two women had been allowed into his harem. One was Hanada, and the other was Anko. The blonde sighed as he remembered how both of his girlfriends had met. Flashback, two years ago, Hayuga compound Naruto in the least to say nervous, while waiting to escort Hanada to their date. Hiyashi bored a hole into the blonde. After a few moments of allowing Naruto to sweat, Hiyashi smiled. Naruto, you do promise to treat my daughter with the respect and dignity that is shown for her position. Correct? Hiyashi asked, in a sentence that was not really in the area to say the wrong thing. Naruto swallowed nervously, the bouquet of lilies shaking slightly. Naruto nodded, not trusting his voice. Luckily Hinata appeared, rescuing the death-fearing blonde from his torment. Hanada looked ravishing in a dark purple form-fitting dress with a slight V-cut that showed a little of her bust accompanied by a pair of lavender high heels. The straps crossing up part of her thighs. Naruto's heart stopped and time seemed to stand still as he looked at the Hayuga heiress. Hanada was in the same boat as Naruto had stood wearing a nice button-down shirt that was silver and red with a fox motif on one side, paired with a set of dark blue dress slacks. His hair had been, tamed, slightly with it ending being pulled into a ponytail. The teens were suddenly brought back to reality by a cough from Hiyashi, who motioned with his eyes to the bouquet of flowers in Naruto's hands. Naruto suddenly remembering the flowers, stood up and handed them to Hinata. Flowers, I brought you some Hinatas, Naruto told the beauty that had appeared before him. Hinata giggled, I will gladly accept these Hinatas, handing them to her sister to go put into water and set them in her room. Naruto looked confused before he rubbed the back of his neck from nervousness, sorry, I meant I hope you like the flowers. Makoto had tried her best to teach him how to act out in a romantic public setting, rather than just being surrounded by friends. Most of her teachings got through the teen's thick skull, the only thing that he could not get a handle on was ballroom dancing. Naruto-san, I bailave that I have held you up long enough, I will allow you to escort my daughter on this date. I wish her to be home by 10 o'clock tonight. I will warn you, if one hair is out of place. Hiyashi left the threat hanging in the air. Naruto swallowed hard, knowing the promise of pain and suffering in the silence that was left in the air. Hi, Hiyashi-sama. Naruto replied, his already shaking confidence starting to shake even more. Tu-san, stop it. You know that Naruto will be a perfect gentleman, Hinata told her father. It is a father's duty to make sure that a candidate is a daikute for his daughter. Hiyashi informed her with a raised eyebrow, sensing that this pairing would be a wise choice. No matter what the Hayuga elders would say or try, Hiyashi would be damned they tried to ruin his daughter's chance to be happy and more confident. He saw to that after their little accident a few months before. Hiyashi started to put more pressure on them as head of the Hayuga clan, more than once reminding them that they were advisors. Have fun, Hanada kun Naruto, enjoy your date. Hiyashi stated as the pair went out the door, 
Naruto opening the door for Hanada and following after her. She's a San, follow them. Try to be discreet. I don't want her first date to be ruined by thinking I don't trust her choice. Hiyashi explained to one of the branch cadets. Hiya, Hiyashi sama, Shiza accepted and left to follow the couple. With Naruto and Hanada. So, Naru kun, what's on the agenda for tonight? Hanada asked, trying to settle the nervous blonde. I've booked us reservations at the Dancing Rose. Naruto told her, leading her towards their destination. The Dancing Rose, isn't that the most expensive restaurant in the village? Hanada asked, surprised that Naruto could afford such pleasures. Nothing but the best for my heim, Naruto stated to Hanada. As restaurant came into view Naruto got nervous again, feeling exposed, the events of that night flashed in the back of his mind. That event had rattled him, he shook the feeling of dread off as they entered the restaurant. As the couple stepped forward, the hostess looked up smiling. Welcome to the dancing rose. How may I help you this evening? The hostess asked. Two reservations under Uzumaki, Naruto stated, his palms sweating slightly. Uzumaki, Uzumaki, ah, yes, here you are sir, please follow me. The hostess motioned. The hostess set them at a table next to a large fountain that had what looked to be a swan in mid-takeoff in the middle of it. A waiter appeared as the hostess left. May I take your orders? The waiter asked kindly. Uh, do you have any suggestions? Naruto asked, his nervousness setting back in slightly. First date, the waiter asked. That obvious. I'm sorry if it's too much to ask. Naruto told the waiter. Not at all. How about a steak with roasted potatoes and green beans for you sir and would your lovely girlfriend like a steamed salmon filet with a nice salad to accompany it? The waiter asked. Yes, that sounds lovely. Hanada told the waiter, smiling. Naruto nodded as the waiter looked towards the blonde to confirm the order. As they waited on their order Hanada told Naruto of her mother and how she was the one to teach Hanada about gardening and baking in which turned into her love for them. Naruto sat there and gazing at her beauty saying the right things at the right moment. Even telling her of some pranks that he had pulled off successfully. Soon Hanada's order arrived, the salmon filet was mouth-watering. As she took the first bite, the flavor exploded in her mouth. Her body shook from the deliciousness of her food. About halfway through her plate she noticed that Naruto's food had yet to appear. Frowning slightly, she went to call the waiter back over. No Hanada, it's okay. I'm guessing it's taking longer than expected with my order. I had a big lunch, so it'll be fine for a bit. Naruto told her smiling. But Naruto, Hanada started. No buts Heim, please let's just enjoy the evening. Naruto begged her. Hanada nodded, seeing that the blonde wanted her to have a good time. Soon Hanada had finished her plate and still Naruto's order had not arrived. As the waiter came and offered the bill to Naruto, which had both orders on it clearly. Naruto paid the price for both orders and even left a generous tip. The hostess appeared again, this one different from the one that had sat them. Ma'am, if you would like I can escort your date out for you and you can eat in peace, the new hostess explained. No thank you, that will not be needed as I had just finished. We are leaving, and if this is how you treat all of your customers then we are not returning to this establishment. Hanada explained in sickly sweet tone, smiling as she explained. With that being said, Hanada flowed toward the entrance her arm laced with Naruto's. Her nails digging into Naruto's arm, drawing a bit of blood. During this entire ordeal Naruto said nothing. They had walked about a block from the restaurant before Hanada turned to Naruto. Now that we are done with that, would you like to go eat? Hanada asked her date. I'll eat later Haim, it wasn't a problem, as long as you are happy. Naruto told her with a smile. No. We are getting you something to eat. Now, no arguing, Hanada told the blonde, pulling him the next dining establishment they went past. Which happened to be an all night dango shop. Hi, we would like some dango with red bean paste. Hanada told the owner. Ma'am, would you like to be somewhere more robust setting in your attire? The owner asked. Sir, we were at a robust establishment earlier. I would not go there again if the Hokage ordered me to go. Hanada replied in a sick tone. Okay then, order of dango with red bean paste coming up, the owner confirmed. Sitting at the bar, 
They were just talking about random things when suddenly an arm appeared around Naruto's neck and pulled him into an ample bust. Gaki, I thought you would never eat Dango. Has the end times began, or are you a weird doppelganger that loves nothing but Dango rather than ramen? A voice teased. Unfortunately you are to be disappointed Anko-chan. I'm the same ramen-loving Naruto as ever. Hanada Haim forced me to get food. Naruto commented. NN Naruto, who is this? I know she's Karania Nisan's friend but how do you know her? Hanada stuttered at the blonde who was pulling himself from the embrace of the snake mistress. Anko lives in the training ground I use for practice. Naruto explained, seeing the dango that was set in front of him. He grabbed a stick and started to eat the food. Hum. Anko-san, who are you to Naruto? Hanada asked Bodly, her eyes holding a small flame in them. Huh, Omi and Naru-kun go back a few years. I meet him when he decided to throw a tiger into the wall of my tower. Anko explained, she had noticed the look in the young Hyuga's eyes and was slightly impressed by the gall that she took. Okay, Naruto did you want to do something else tonight? Hanada asked in a cold tone that stated she did not want to be here longer than necessary. Uh, yeah, Anko-chan, I'll see y'all later. Okay, Naruto bid the snake mistress goodbye. He went outside, turning he noticed that Hanada was staring daggers at the scantily cladded woman. Who are you really to Naruto? Hanada asked in a serious tone. I'm someone who wants Naruto to be happy, if that means I have to be a backburner then I will be. So help me if you break his heart. I don't care if Kami, itself comes down and tells me to apologize for what I do to you. I won't do it, Anko replied in tone that matched Hanada's. One final question, do you love Naruto? Hanada asked, it was more of a confidence thing than an actual question. How about we tell Naruto that we are going to have a woman talk and let him go do something for a minute? Anko explained sensing the weariness coming from the young teen. Hanada nodded and explained to Naruto that Anko and herself wanted to talk for a bit. Naruto rubbed the back of his head from nervousness, I saw something a few shops back. I'll be back in a few minutes. As Naruto left the two women, a air of seriousness enveloped the women. Now that he's gone, again do. You, love, Naruto. Hanada asked punkatting the question. I do, he's someone that I can relate to. He hides so much for the happiness of his loved ones. He carries a mask that he won't let down, not unless you can make him. I can only do it in exchange of shedding my mask for a few moments. I will never ask him to shed it in front of others. It's the pain that we both feel that we have connected with each other. I guess it was around when he turned nine that I started to have a crush after warding him in the shadows. Anko explained, more worried for the young blonde rather than herself. This is was a situation that she had to tread carefully in otherwise she could push not only the teen she had came to love, but also another who he had started to open up to. Hanada sat thinking over what Anko had just told her, and she came up with only one solution. Hanada turned to Anko, her position showing to the older woman. I want you to shed your mask for a minute. I need you to show me what you are speaking of. Hanada explained. Anko swallowed, this was it. A now or never moment one of those moments that could make her break her fellow mask wilder. Anko closed her eyes, taking a deep breath. Hanada stared adamantly at the snake mistress, suddenly she felt as if she was drowning. The air suddenly no longer existed, only pain and suffering were there. Eyes that her father showed a few times with weariness. Only these were more intense, concentrated even. Anko pulled her mask back up, burying the pain and suffering back down. She noticed that the young heiress was shaking hard physically. That is my pain. I only ask you this out of my love for Naruto. Please, please don't ask him to shed his mask. Not until he is ready, until he is willing. It might take years, or even decades. Trust me, he will show you it. Anko explained and begged the heiress. I will not ask Naruto to shed his mask until he wishes. Anko, I would love it if we could share Naruto's love. I feel that if we try together, then his pain might ease. Hanada explained, she had felt Naruto's worry when she explained to him that her and Anko wanted to talk. Hey Hina Haim, Anko-chan. I'm back, Naruto announced himself to the two women. Naru-kun, I want to say something. Hanada spoke gently in a calm tone. Okay, did you not like the date? Naruto asked, 
worried that Hanada wasn't happy with how the night went. No, 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 that's not it. Um, if it's okay with you. Hanada started, sighing she pushed through, knowing that if she didn't do this now, she never would be able to. Anko chan and I would like to share our love with you. Hanada told the blonde, to show her point Hanada nodded to Anko. Anko stood up in front of the blonde, grabbing Naruto's shirt, the snake mistress kissed him. Needless to say, Naruto was shocked, he had been beating himself to find a way to be with both of them. Yet, they had settled with putting Naruto above themselves rather than fighting for him like a couple of fangirls. Hanada stood next to the couple, tapping Naruto on his shoulder to let him know that she was still there. Naruto turned his attention to his other Haim, only to be pulled into another kiss. This one more intense than the one he had before, after a few moments the kiss ended. Naruto stood frozen, seeing both of these women kissing him without even being enraged with the other had shocked him to his core. Naruto, come back to us, Anko was saying, as Naruto came around. Huh, oh the things I wanted to get you guys. Naruto fumbled with not only his emotions, but with the two packages that he had with him. Um, I hope you both enjoy them. They wrapped them the same, so you might have to switch. Naruto explained. Opening the packages that Naruto had presented to them, both women gasped at the beauty of the gifts. Hanada's package had a dragon pendant made of amethyst, that looked more elegant than fierce. As if it was made just for her, recognizing her position as a princess of the Hyuga clan. Anko's package had a fierce fox talisman made from topaz, sheer wildness that the fox emitted was just for her. Showing the truth that she was overly protective of not just her village, but of her loved ones. Both women stared at the pendants, tears barely being held in check. Naruto started to get worried, it had been a few minutes since he had gave them their gifts. Naruto, would you like to place them on us? Hanada asked handing the blonde her pendant. Naruto nodded, placing the amethyst dragon around Hanada's neck. Turning to Anko he repeated the action with the topaz fox. One good thing is these have a seal on them so that they'll never fade or break on accident. Naruto explained. They're beautiful Naruto, I can't think of a more beautiful way to end the night. Hanada and Anko both expressed in total admiration. Naruto happened to look at a clock as the group passed a timepiece shop, seeing how late as was getting started to pull Hanada along. Shit, Hanada it's 5 minutes till 10. Your dad's gonna kill me. Naruto started to worry. Hatchling, use your wind chakra. You'll be there in a minute. Grandine told the blonde. Mentally slapping himself, he turned to Hanada. I'm sorry to be so forward, but I'm gonna have to carry you. Don't want to risk hurting you, otherwise your dad will kill me. Hanada looked confused for a moment before she nodded. Naruto picked her up bridal style. Anko, I'll take you out next time. Naruto promised. Wait, before you go. Anko told him. She turned Naruto's head to face her and gave him a light kiss. Till next time. Naruto smiled. Till next time hubby Haim. With that said. Naruto applied wind chakra to his feet and jumped onto the roof. As soon as they had landed on the roof he started to sprint, not a normal shinobi sprint. It was one that seemed that a demon from hell had started to chase him. The scenery blurred past as Naruto pushed himself. In moments the Hyuga compound was in sight, slowing down he landed at the front gate just as the clock struck ten. Naruto gently placed Hinata down. Hiyashi opened the gate, seeing that his daughter was on time. Cocking an eyebrow at the state of her hair, he would have asked, but having seen the speed at which Naruto had came back to heal Hanada he was not surprised. Um, we lost track of time, Naruto explained nervously. I see, Hiyashi commented, turning to his daughter he looked her over. Did you enjoy yourself Hanada? Hiyashi asked, it was wonderful too San, I would like to have another if that is acceptable, Hanada inquired. I'll give you three more minutes. Hiyashi stated and went back through the front gate, leaving it slightly ajar for Hanada. Naruto turned to Hanada, I had fun. Like I said, I'm sorry for rushing it at the end. Naru kun, I enjoyed my time with you. I'm glad that we went on this date, I'm also glad that I found a person that loves you as much as I do. Hanada calmed the worried blonde, she then cupped his face and kissed him. Hiyashi was watching on the other side of the gate smiling at the interaction that was happening. 
he would approve of his daughter dating Naruto, and since he knew of Naruto's admittance into the CRA, he wanted his daughter to be happy with whatever choice she made, even if that meant screen each candidate for Naruto's harem. Hanada, it's time, Hiyashi informed his daughter. Hiya, Chu san, I'm coming. Naru kun, I'll see you at school. Hanada bid the blonde farewell and good night. Naruto stood there for a minute processing all that happened tonight, he then turned and started to head towards the Uchiha district. Makoto had made him promise that after each date he was to tell her what happened so they could improve to the next level of dating. Present day, Shinobi Academy. Naruto was brought out of his reminiscing of his first date with Hinata and the meeting of his two beautiful Himes, by a hand that was waving in front of his face. Naru kun, did you hear me? Hinata asked. Huh? Naruto asked confused. I asked what are you doing after? Hinata asked again, knowing that the blonde was remembering something. Oh, I have no idea. What do you want to do? Naruto asked. I thought we would go grab Anko chan and Kurunai chan to celebrate. Hanada stated to boyfriend. That sounds good, I haven't seen Kurunai since summer break. Naruto remembered. They had been invited to a lake party over the summer, but that would be for another moment to think back on. Naruto Uzumaki, Uruka called. Good luck, Naru kun. Hanada wished, kissing him. It was Naruto's turn to get the catcalls from the boys. As Naruto entered the testing room, Naruto knew he had this part in the bag. He remembered all the training Anko had put him through to make sure his chakra control wasn't shit. Naruto I need you to do a henge, a kawarimi, and finally a bushin. Naruto nodded and hanged himself into an exact double of Aruka. Aruka looked Naruto over and found no flaws in his henge. He then kawarimied, a poof of smoke showed a giggling Sarutobi reading an orange book. Um, Hokage-sama, shouldn't you be doing paperwork? Aruka deadpanned. Aruka, why are you in my office? Sarutobi asked. Naruto kawarimied with you, Aruka explained. Naruto reappeared as he kawarimied again. Aruka nodded putting down some notes. Finally, the bushin, Aruka stated. Can I use any bushin, or does it have to be the E ranked? Naruto incurred. I guess any would be fine. Uruka stated, wondering what the blonde was up to. Naruto did the set of seals for an E rank bushin, at the end he added a few extra seals. Suddenly six small smoke clouds popped up. Surrounding Naruto were five winged lizards and a fox was perched on his head. Naruto, you were supposed to create a bushin of realistic creatures. Not legendary creatures, Uruka explained, I'm sorry, but I'm gone. Hey hatchling, did you bushin us here for the graduation test? The red-winged lizard asked. Yeah Igneal, Uruka sensei said I could do any. So I wanted to try it out. Naruto explained to the fire drake. Which one is Uruka? The grey-winged lizard asked. Naruto pointed at Uruka, the white-winged lizard flew over to him and looked at him as if judging him. He's okay. The white-winged lizard stated, before flying back to Naruto. So Uruka, do I pass? Naruto asked, smirking slightly. Um, Naruto Uzumaki, pass. Uruka told the blonde, still stunned at the creatures that were not only solid bushins but were talking to the said blonde. Awesome, come on me and nay sans. Let's go tell Hina Haim that I passed. Naruto told the group as he put he headband on and left. What the fuck was that? Uruka asked out loud, was I tripping? Chomp, owww, Uruka exclaimed, a small igneal on his foot, nope not tripping. Naruto, Uruka yelled, then threw igneal out the door after the blonde shinobi. With Naruto and his family, igneal came flying out of the classroom, the little serpent twisted in the air. He caught himself and soared over to Naruto's shoulder. He asked, I was trying to help. Igneal informed the group. Naruto sat down next to Hinata, smiling broadly. Hiya Haim, meet my family. The new jutsu worked, on a small scale. I'll have to work with it to bring them fully out. Naruto explains as the creatures played around. The other students starting to surround them, seeming interested in the creatures. The females stared with unsated hunger at the fox on Naruto's head. Feeling a foreboding aura coming from them, the fox jumped onto Hinata's lap crawling under her jacket to hide. I'm too cute and fluffy to die. The fox exclaimed. Q Nisan, they won't try anything. 
Naruto told the fox, as the students had become quickly uninterested when one of the dragons snapped at a finger of one of the more unruly students. You are not allowed to touch, you brats. The white dragon warned as the student tried to poke him. Now that's over, hatchling are you going to introduce us or just let your heim wonder who we are? The dark grey dragon informed the blonde. Oh, sorry, Hanada, this is Metalakana. Naruto told her point to the dark grey dragon. Yo, Metalakana greeted, Skiadram and Weislegia, pointing to the white and black dragons. Hi, hello, we do tricks for treats. As the two took off in preformed mutipool pool aerial flips and twists. Yeah, yeah, jokesters, here, Naruto told them pulling out some jerky in which the two landed and started to devour the dried seasoned meat. Grandine, pointing to a silvery dragon. It's a pleasure to meet you, Hanada-chan. Naruto has told us so much about you. Grandine stated politely, telling a half-truth, as they were sealed into Naruto. Igneal, pointing to the deep red dragon. At least the hatchling has some manners. Igneal informed Hanada, who giggled at this. And finally the fluff ball in your jacket is Q. Naruto finished as Q popped her head out and licked Hanada's cheek. You are so soft, Kayubi stated, causing both teens to blush ever so slightly, mainly due to where Kayubi was located when the statement was made. Guys, this is Hanada Haim. I hope as I get this jutsu down that you will allow her to summon yourselves. Naruto explained to the group. In a flash all five dragons and Kayubi were lined single file, staring hard at Hanada. The combined look started to scare the pale-eyed team. Suddenly Grandine stepped forward, her eyes softing. It would be an honor. Grandine told the teens, bowing slightly. Thanks guys, I'll see you all later. Naruto told them dispelling the jutsu, all of them poofing back into the seal. Enko and Karania chan want to take us somewhere later. They said to wear something formal but still fun. Hanada explained to her boyfriend. Knowing that, it could be anything. Naruto told her smiling gently. Lighting country, sealed room. The man was lighting his fingers on fire one by one. The black flames dancing back and forth on his hand. Will you guys hurry up? I wanna go tear something up. The man told the sealed coffins in a bored tone. It was becoming extremely hard not to go over and start prying the lids off the coffins. Suddenly he heard one of the coffins click and release a hiss. Finally, who is coming out now? The blonde-haired man wondered. As the lid swung open a woman stepped out, her skin pale, even before being sealed, her skin being more sheen as her long dark purple hair flowed down her back. Sporting a Chinese dress that showed some cleavage and had a split on either side of her thighs. Taking a look around she spotted the blonde-haired man, sighing she rubbed her head. Weren't you supposed to be let out last? The woman asked. It think I was, don't remember. I've just been bored waiting on you guys. Now I want to go fight something or someone, the man told her. Well, let's get out of here and grab some food. Our host should be outside with some, the woman informed the man, before stepping up to the door and waving her hand over it. The door crumbled into dust as the woman waved her hand. She then went back to the coffins and waved her hand again. The objects returning to the same shape they had been when first used. The woman stepped up to one of them, that had a heart carved on it. My daughter, hurry so we can be reunited. It's been so long, I have missed you so much, my angel, the woman told the coffin. Another coffin, a snake carved into it, clicked and released a hiss. A man stepped out, stretching his arms. One eye closed due to scarring, while the other purple serpent eye looked around at the cave. His maroon hair blown back a purple serpent with wings drapping across his shoulders. He sported a black shirt with crimson pants, and a white trench coat. Am I too late? The man asked. No, you are right on time. Of course we have one who was too early, the woman explained. Hum, who was that? The man asked, then looking past the doorway he frowned. He spotted the blonde-haired man sitting next to a fire that had been made in the large cavern past the doorway. Oh, him. Why did we have him sealed with us? The man asked the woman as he walked past her, smelling fresh air mixed with cooking meat. We needed his strength and combat prowess, the woman informed the man. Sighing, the man shook his head. Why couldn't we had sealed Gray or even Leon? He asked. Upon hearing the name, Gray, 
the woman turned and kicked the man in the back of the head. Never say that name again. I can never forgive that bastard. Not for as long as I live. The woman told the man furiously. PFF. So easily riled. The man commented at her, then left to eat. He was starving after being sealed up for ages. Soon we will take control of this world and shape it to our image. The woman stated to the midnight black coffin. Kohonakagar. Night time. In the middle of Kohonakagar was a bar. Not just any bar. This one had a backroom access that only a few privileged were allowed in. The only way to enter this backroom was to be formally invited or be brought as a plus one. It was in this place that elite shinobi could relax, calm themselves or even cut loose every once in a while. The Whispering Lotus, I've only here that elites could be allowed access. What are we doing here? Hanada asked. Hanada was dressed in a snug black dress that curved in all the right places, complementing her flared hips and large bust. Her dragon pendant setting perfectly above her cleavage. Finishing the outfit were a pair of dusty purple spiked heels. We thought that you and Naru kun should have at least one memory of where he is not scorned other than Ichiraku ramen and a handful of shinobi shops. Enko explained, as he walked arm in arm with Naruto. A tan dress shirt that the top buttons were undone to allow a view, her fox talisman pulling the focus to her assets. Skillfully accompanied by a rusty brown thigh-length skirt, with a pair of brown leather stilettos. So, we are going to an elite backroom bar. Naruto asked nervous that they might be not treated right, even with the promise of a release from the hated and disgusted looks that he had become used to. Naruto was dressed in a formal shirt with a dragon motif wrapping around his torso, its head laying on his right shoulder. Pair with black dress slacks and polished dress shoes. No, you've heard of rumors that the Whispering Lotus. I'll be the first to tell you that the rumors are true. Now for the rules of the Whispering Lotus. Rule number one. Masks are worn at all times and no names given, no one is to know who you are other than the company that you enter with. Rule number two, you don't accept any drinks from anyone but the bartender or staff. Rule number three, no matter what happens you leave with who you came in with. Rule number four, no weapons, jutsus, or seals allowed in there. The final rule, no matter what happens do not fight or defend yourself when attacked. Breaking of these rules result in not only the revoking of the person's membership. They may also end up in taking a trip to the hospital that will leave them in the ICU or even the coma ward for a few months. Karania explained, her red satin dress leaving little to the imagination, as it hiked up to mid thigh The V-cut flared at the top and came to a point just below the top of stomach. She wore a pair of crimson red heels to pull it all together. The group came to a set of stairs leading to a single door with a white blooming lotus painted onto it. The group stopped at the door, Enko held up her hand. She then knocked, two short raps, three hard knocks, paused, then finished with a hard knock. A eye slit opened up revealing a pair of golden eyes, it did a quick look before sliding closed. Another larger access point slide open to reveal three black masks and one white. Black for the ladies, white for the gentlemen. Remember the rules, and do enjoy yourselves, a voice behind the lotus informed them. Once the masks were situated onto the group's faces, the wall to the right of them parted to reveal a staircase leading down. The light coming from the staircase, was light red, gave off a warmth as if in a lover's embrace. Karania and Hanada led the way, moving down the stairs elegantly as if they were walking through the softest silk. Karania's arm was under Hanada's with her hand slightly tipped and Hanada's hand on top. Enko on the other hand was having a hard time with the stiff form of Naruto, finally having enough the pair stopped their descent. Naruto, nothing will happen. You need to relax, have fun. Enko told him with a smile, she then gently kissed him. The blonde started to relax a little bit more after his hubby Haim told him to. After a few moments, Naruto took a deep breath and nodded. With this they continued their descent. Karania and Hinata were off to the side of the entrance, calmly waiting for the pair. With a nod from Naruto showing that he was fine, the group entered the Whispering Lotus. Whatever rumors that Naruto and Hinata had heard, were put to shame. They entered into a red velvet room, the light were dimmed and the air was filled with a light incense that relaxed the mood of any high-strung shinobi that had either had too much on their plate or they had just come off a high-stressed mission. 
There were around a dozen booths lining the walls, only about a fourth of them were filled. A handful of people were loitering the bar which was in the middle of the room set against the back, the front half was a polished grey marble dance floor. A few couples were gently swaying to the steady stream of soft music. A host appeared as the group of shinobi entered. He held a tray out to them, Karania and Anko both set their shinobi ids on the tray. Mistresses Hubby and Rose, would you like your normal booth or a more accommodating setting? Also are your guests to be allowed access or are they just a plus one for now? We would like a private booth. Our guests are just a plus one for now. Virgin drinks for them, Anko told their host. Understood, I'll make note of future Lotus members. May I have your names? The host inquired. Yes I am hi. Starlight. Hanada told the man, almost missing rule number one. Mistress Starlight, and you sir. The man asked to the still slightly anxious Naruto, as he wrote Hanada's name into the logbook. Kitsune. Naruto informed the man. Ah, Master Kitsune, I believe you have several people here who did not enjoy what you had done on Double Z Day. I myself was quite adamant of the events that had been set up, the host informed Naruto. Thank you, it is always nice to meet a fan. Naruto complimented the man. If you'll follow me, I will set you in room P3. The host informed them leading them to a small private hallway that were lined with half a dozen doors. Stopping at the door that labeled, P3 feet, the host produced a small key ring, holding seven keys. Unlocking the door, the host stepped back and bowed to the group allowing them to enter. I will have a more, diverse, member of our staff join you in a few moments. The bar is to your left. If you wish for a song the entertainment system is to the right. Enjoy your time at the Whispering Lotus, the host explained, then left. Wow, this had to be super expensive, Naruto commented, looking at the rich satin couches that sat against the wall. A high-end stereo system was equipped with over a thousand songs, Hanada started to look through them as they enjoyed each other's company. Enko and Karania sat on one of the couches, suddenly the couch started to slightly heat and vibrate. Oh, m m m m m y g g g g g g o d. I'm in love with this couch. Anko told the group, her stress melting as the heat and vibrations relaxed the snake mistress body. A few moments later a knock was heard at the door. Opening it a woman with light green hair and a green and blue feathered mask stood in front waiting for permission to enter. Good evening, I'm Kujaku. I'll be your bartender for this evening. Kujaku informed them as she set herself behind the bar. A Kayubi, one virgin Kayubi, an angel dust, and some sparkling cider. Karania ordered. Yes mistress. Kujaku bowed slightly, the started to mix the drinks. In a show of flair and expertise, that left the two plus ones in awe. Kujaku set up the glasses and started spinning two bottles in her hand. She tipped the bottles forward and filled two of the glasses a little with two different liquids crossing the streams a couple of times, before adding some hot sauce to one and some lavender petals to the other. Kujaku, then turned and made the same as the first Kayubi except with spiced juice. To finalize the order she pulled a long-stemmed champagne glass out and popped the cork on a bottle of apple cider, filling the glass to a breath from the top. Kujaku placed the orders on a tray, carrying them as if they were made of the most fragile objects in the world. She set them on the small table in front of the couches, she then pulled out a packet of matches and lit the two Kayubis on fire. If that is all. Kujaku asked, bowing. Karania nodded, allowing the bartender to return to her station. Hubby, a Kayubi, Kitsune, you'll have to have the virgin Kayubi. Trust me, the real drink is so much better. Sparkling cider for starlight, and finally angel dust for myself. Karania rattled off, grabbing her drink and sipping it lightly. After the drink she sighed in content. Are all the staff here shinobi? Naruto asked the two older women. Yes they are. They do this for fun or relaxation, even though the staff gets paid an average of a small B rank mission. Anko explained, sipping on her drink. Her face turned a slightly darker red as she blew some steam out of her mouth. Kujaku, may I ask what your field of expertise is? Hanada inquired at the bartender. I am a ninjutsu specialist mixed with some tiahutsu. I put a show on every second Saturday of the month here. If you wish to see it, I'm sure I can make an arrangement Mistress Starlight. Kujaku informed Hanada. Suddenly a loud thump could be heard on the other side of the wall behind the bar. 
Reaching up Kujuku tapped her mask twice, the mask switched to a reddish color with a band of gold. Kujuku, we need you to restrain an Okupiant in, P5 feet. Thank you. A voice suddenly spoke over an intercom. Never a calm day, just one day, is that too much to ask? Threat level, Kujuku asked. Code green, light measures. Please escort Master Hound and Mistress Tigeress out, the voice replied. Revoking of membership or a wrist slap, Kujuku tried to confirm. Wrist slap, they just had too much to drink. No harmful intent noted, just an accident, the voice replied. If you'll excuse me, mistresses and master, I'll return, Kujuku told them as she headed to the door. As Kujuku left, Naruto looked to Anko with a confused look. The codes had thrown him off. Green, blue, yellow, orange, and finally red. Green is mostly people get too happy with their drinks, blue and up are more physical. Nia Chan and I have been coming here for a couple years, we've only heard of one orange incident. That was when an Inazaka was shit faced and tried to fornicate with his animal partner. On the main dance floor. Something you never want to see, or think about. Unless you are into that. Anko smirked as both Naruto and Hinata blushed. There has been only one code red since this place had opened, only then did the owner appear to stop the debate. It was a good thing to, apparently the jutsus that the people were going to use, were at least an A rank. Anyways, let's just enjoy our drinks and then be on our way. Karinia added to the explanation. Naruto sipped on his virgin Kayubi, it was spicy, yet it felt undermined, as if the kick was missing. Rose-chan, you are right this one is weak. I know right, I had the Kayubi one time and it felt like my face was on fire. The it started to burn my core, I never thought water would taste so sweet. Karinia sighed, finishing her drink. After a few more hours of just relaxing and enjoying the company of each other the group headed out. Anko wobbled out more than walked, aided by Naruto and Karinia. The host that had showed them to their room bowed as they left. Please return when you feel the world is too loud. The lotus will reduce it to a whisper. Kohanakagor Shinobi Academy, team placement it had been a few days after the graduation exam. Naruto and Hinata were both a little anxious to find out which team they would be on. Uruka stood at the front of the class smiling proudly at the class that had been his pride and joy for the last four years. My student, after today I will not be able to enjoy your company for eight hours a day. I do wish you luck and bless you for the years to come. Uruka speeched quickly, now team placements. Team 1 will be. Naru kun, no matter what team we are placed on, I'll always make time for you, Hanada promised. I know my heim. It'll just be a little harder not being able to see your beauty every day, Naruto complimented. Oh you. If you keep teasing me, I might have to tell Tusan to draw up a marriage contract, Hinata teased back. Naruto chalked a little at the mention of being married, though due to the CRA that Sarutobi informed him that he needed to have at least several candidates for marriage by the age of 18. Team 8 will consist of Shino Aburame, Hinata Hayuga, and Naruto Uzumaki. Your instructor will be. Suddenly a ball of cloth shot into the classroom, unfurling to read, Anko Midarashi, Jonan of Team 6 Tracking, Retrieval and Torture. Okay. Which one of you lucky vict? I mean people are my team? Anko asked the stunned class. Noticing Naruto, she read the sign he had held up, 4 tenths, Hinata had one that read, 5 tenths. Guys that was at least a 7. What did I do wrong? Anko complained childishly. A smoke bomb and maybe a flash bomb would have boosted you to a 7. If you had rode in on Kisha after the bombs, I would have given you an 8. Maybe a 9, Naruto stated. Hanada nodded next to him. You also could have been a little bit scarier, and the smoke bomb would have had to been colored, she commented. Shino nodded at the insane woman, agreeing with his teammates, you could have done better. With that I'm guessing you three are my team. Okay. Meet me at training ground 44, or as I like to call it, home. Ten minutes or one of my pets can escort you, Anko explained. Hanada? Naruto asked, holding out his arms. Let's go. I'm good without an escort. Hanada accepted in a scared tone. Hopping into his arms, bridal style. Naruto sped off, leaving a breeze behind him. Shino looked at the Jonin sensei puzzled. Anko did a few hand signs, and a small cloud poofed. 
out of the cloud a snake as tall as Anko appeared. Mita, it seems that we have a slow learner here, could you please escort him to the house? Anko asked in a sweet voice that promised pain. With please sure, Mistress Anko. Mita replied, before striking out at the bug boy. Oh fuck! Was all that came out of Shino's mouth as he took off. The class was frozen for a few seconds after the ordeal was over. What the hell just happened? Uruka asked, the only answer he had returned to him was silence. Training ground 44, Forest of Death, five minutes later. Gasping slight Shino was needless to say pissed off, sweat was pouring off him. He had made it in the time frame. It didn't help that his new sensei's pet had nipped at his heels every other second, forcing him to stay at a dead run. Naruto san, who is this crazy bitch? The usual static bug user breaking face. Oh, this is Anko Haim. Naruto stated, having reached the training ground three minutes earlier with Hinata. Anko clicked a pocket watch open. Looking at it, then at the teens, she shook her head. Blondie, I had expected you to be here in less than 30 seconds. Pale eyes, you should have be here in four minutes if you had ran by yourself. Finally, bug boy, you were 30 seconds too late. Now for introductions. Let's start with the blonde Gaki. Anko criticized the three teens, as she shut the watch. Um, Anko sensei. What do you mean introductions, could you explain? Hinata asked. Sure. My name is Anko Mitarashi. My likes are Dango, snakes, various forms of torture, and a certain Gaki. My dislikes are a certain snake pedophile, people who can't look underneath the underneath. My dreams are to get revenge on said pedophile and be happy again. Anko told the group, now, Blondie. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. My likes are ramen, training, and my himes. My dislikes are people who can't tell the difference between a sword and a seath, people who think others are dispossible, and the three minutes it take to cook ramen. My dream is to become strong to protect the ones I love, and make sure they're happy for the rest of their lives. Naruto rattled off. Okay, pale eyes. You're next, Enko pointed to Hinata. My name is Hinata Hayuga. My likes are baking, gardening, trying to perfect my own style of Jukin, and Naru kun. My dislikes are people who treat others like dirt, people who hurt others just for fun, and the Kago no Tori no Juin. My dreams are to one day bring my clan back together, and to be happy with the ones I love. Hinata told her team, blushing slightly near the end. Finally, Buggy. Anko motioned to Shino. My name is Shino Aburame. My likes are researching insects and meditating. My dislikes are people who refer to others as insects, chemical insecticides, and the squashing of the more helpful bugs. My dreams are to become a strong clan head and to discover new species of insects. Shino stated in a monotone voice. This is an interesting team the Hokage set up for me. Okay, that's all for today. Meet me here at 8 in the morning. We'll have the test then. Enko told them. What? Why would we have to take another test? Didn't we just graduate? Naruto asked, the three teens confused. Do you really think that thing they call a test meant you were actual shinobi of the village? No, that was to weed out the hopefuls. Tomorrow you'll take a test to see if you can actually become shinobi. Anko explained, showing no remorse. Anko then smiled sweetly, one that promised pain and death, try not to bore me to bad. Flashback. One day ago, Hokage's office Sarutobi sat looking at the papers in front of him. He had just finalized the team positions. Looking up, the red-eyed woman standing before him was pissed at the Hokage. He had taken the chance she had to watch over the child she considered a sister. Why are you not taking my request, Hokage? Karinia asked the aged man. Do not mistake me denying your request. You are a capable shinobi, but you need to focus on your physical form. I also think you need to try to have a stronger emotional and mental structure. I just believe that you are not ready to command a team. Serutobi explained to the Janin. Then who will get team 8? Karinia asked the old shinobi. Anko will take command of team 8. She is more than capable of handling those three. I also think this will be a good experience for her. Commanding a team may help her grow more, and become more steadfast rather than headstrong. Serutobi explained his reasoning to the Genjutsu mistress. I still think that you should have let me take command of Team 6. The Janin finished as she left his office. 
Anko needs to have more connections to this village rather than just the hate of her former sensei. I hope this team can help. Serutobi thought to himself, hoping that he had made the correct choice. Training Ground 44, Forest of Death, Day After Team Selections It was 15 minutes till 8 when the three teens appeared in front of the main gate to the training ground. Ah, hello my little victims, are you ready for your test? A sadistic sounding voice asked the teens. Looking up they saw their sensei standing on a branch of one of the large trees. Jumping down, Anko pulled out a timer. Okay maggots, here's what your test will be. As we are going to be a tracking and recovery type team, if you pass, you will have to find and return one, Anko, tag within two hours. Each tag will be placed on one of my pets. It will be your choice on how to approach this test. Anko explained to the three teens. Anko sat on a rock just inside the large fenced in training ground, she summoned three person sized snaked. One was Mita, whom Shino had the experience of becoming acquainted with. The other two were her little brother and sister, Mission and Taro. Okay, I'll partner you up with your target, Buggy, since you and Mita are such great friends. You can have her, Blondie, you'll take Mission. Finally, pale eyes, you'll have Taro. Anko placed a tag on each of her pet's heads. We'll give them a five minute head start. Pale eyes, no Bayakugan until the five minutes are up. Buggy, don't place your insects on them. Now that we got that covered, let's begin, shall we? Anko nodded to the snakes, who slithered off into the woods. Five minutes later, Anko turned the clock to two hours. Flee, my little victims, flee and claim your quarry. Muahahaha. The teens' sweat dropped at their insane sensei's antics and rushed into the woods. Let's see if they can understand the true meaning behind this little test. Anko said out loud as soon as the teens were far enough away. She then pulled out a plate of dango and started to consume the sweets. Team 8, 5 kilometers into the forest of death. Okay guys, we have three targets. Anybody got an idea how to capture them? Naruto asked his teammates. I see all the targets, but they have split. Shino, Mita is 2 kilometers to the east. Naruto, Mission is the same to the west. My quarry is up ahead. Hanada commented, her Bayakugan flared. Okay, so we have the locations. The question is how to get the tags? Naruto asked the group. I have an idea, but we would have to work together, Shino suggested. Hum, okay. Shino what's the plan? Naruto asked. After a few moments the group split up, tracking and locating their quarry. With Naruto, what an ugly skin color, and I thought toads looked gross, covered in that mucus. At least they don't have to shed their skin to change clothes. Ha ha ha. Naruto teased the mission. Mission cocked an unseen eyebrow as the blonde container started to speak, but when he heard the comment about being compared to a toad something in the snake snapped. Mission curled up and struck at the blonde. Wow, and so slow too. Are you sure that you're not a worm with teeth? Naruto insulted the large reptile. Mission was enraged and rushed the shinobi. Time and time again it struck, just missing each time. Seeing Naruto had done his job, he rushed back to the meeting place, throwing a few insults every few seconds, so that his quarry stayed with him. With Shino Shino stood in front of Mita. The two stared at each other, neither one moving. Mita San. Shall we have a rematch from yesterday? Shino inquired the large serpent. Why SSSS should I? Mita asked, being cautious, intrigued that the bug user had not tried anything. I was caught off guard, Shino stated, waiting for a reaction. Plus, I really think your agility is lacking. Chero seemed to have a more slender form based for agility. Mita looked at the shinobi as if he had said something stupid. Her agility was lacking, she was the quickest of her siblings. Her speed was next to none in the Habi clan other than Manda, who had experience. Very well, what I SSS the contest? Mita asked the boy. We race for three kilometers. If you lose, I claim your tag, Shino stated. What if I SSSS should win? Mita inquired. You can use me as your plaything, Shino replied. Interesting. I accept. Mita confirmed. Let's begin, Shino stated, running back the way he came. Mita rushed after the Aburame, easily catching up to him and stayed pace with him. 
Shino smirked slightly behind the collar of his jacket, the plan was coming together. He hoped that his teammates were doing their parts. With Hinata Taro was slithering through the forest, taking this task her mistress had given her seriously, failure meant that she was to be punished. Taro did not like to be punished. Sensing something near her, Taro turned to see Hinata drawing back her fist. The large snake dodged the strike, curling onto herself. Turning to flee, she had to dodge again as Hinata struck at the large reptile. Hold still, I want a new handbag, Hinata stated, driving the snake back the way it had came. Hinata knew that she had to drive it back to the meeting place, she just hoped that the plan would work. Clearing in the woods mission had lost his target, it had been several minutes since he had last spotted him. Coming into the clearing, he flicked his tonuge to sense where his victim was. The snake sensed nothing, his target wasn't here, he went to slither back into the woods. Suddenly he caught sight of the blonde shimmering into place in the middle of the clearing. I'm over here you slither wallet, Naruto insulted. Seeing red the reptile went to strike at the shinobi. As the snake reached the blonde teen, something slammed into him. Turning to the new target, he hissed, only to see his sister Mita shaking her head. What's the meaning of this SSS? Mission asked Mita. Where I SSSS the Aburame? Mita retorted, he insulted my SSS speed. I have no idea where that SSSS shinobi I SSSS. Mission told his sister, he then turned back to his prey. Naruto had disappeared in the confusion between the two summons. Suddenly there was a crashing sound as the snakes turned to see one of the smaller trees fall. From the under the tree Taro rapidly slithered to her siblings. Help! This SSSS bitch I SSSSS trying to kill me, Taro exclaimed in fear. I told you to hold still, you scaled worm, Hanada told the snake. Naruto then appeared next to Hanada, Haim, we have them. Shino jumped down from a tree next to the two. Step 1 complete, time for step 2. Shino stated, revealing to the snakes that they had been duped. SSS is shit, all three snakes said at the same time. Shino, make sure they can't get away. Hanada, go in for close combat. Try to paralyze them. I'll act as support for both of you. Let's get this done, we have 30 minutes left. Naruto ordered his teammates, as they set to the tasks given to them. Naruto threw a white ball of light into the snake siblings, Dragon Slayer Arts, Dragon Flare. The light exploded outwards, blinding the snakes. Confused, the three reptiles turned to flee into the woods, only to be stopped by a wall of bugs. The wall spread until the reptiles were surrounded. Insect Labyrinth. Shino stated, standing outside the wall of bugs. Suddenly, Hinata appeared in front of Mita, knowing that she was the quickest of the three. This was the one that had to be taken out first. Striking out quickly, Hinata hit a couple of pressure points on her. Mita colopiced in a pile. Shaking his head to clear his sight from the flash, Mission saw his sister being struck down by the Hyuga. Enraged that they were so easily fooled, he went to strike the Hyuga. Dragon Slayer Arts, Metal Claw. Naruto shouted, his arms turning gray as he slashed down at the snake. Midian dodged the attack slamming into the wall of bugs. The bugs started to drain the snake's chakra, quickly moving away he went to shake off the bugs. You guys need to hurry, I'm losing chakra fast. You got about 30 more seconds Shino thought to himself, feeling his chakra draining quickly from the use of the high-level jutsu. Inside the wall of bugs, Hanada was having a hard time taking out Taro. After witnessing her sister being struck down and her brother fighting the blonde shinobi, she turned her attention to the pale-eyed Hyuga. Slithering in and out of the Hyuga's reach, Hanada was tiring slightly from striking the snake. Taro finally slithered inside the pale-eyed shinobi's defense and constricted her, squeezing the shinobi. Gasping Hanada quickly thought of a way to get out of this situation as Naruto was fighting Mission, who was starting to slip and make mistakes. Shino's insects draining the snake's chakra slowly. Finally she only had one idea that might work. Hey, you slithering pair of heels. Face me like a true snake would. Hanada insulted her cap to her. Taro's face suddenly flashed into view of the Hyuga. What was is that, little mouse? What I said was this. Hanada stated then leaned her head back as far as she could. Then did the most un hyuga like thing ever in a battle. Slamming her head forward, she headbutted the snake. 
Startled by the sudden hit, the snake loosened her body. This allowed Hinata to strike several points on the snake, throwing the snake to the sideline for the rest of the test. Naruto jumped into the air, flashing a few hand signs. Flipping, he brought his foot down onto the mission's head. Dragon Slayer Arts. Metal Sledgehammer Kick. Slamming his foot down on the reptile's head, which in turn slammed into the ground. A small crater was formed under the duress of the attack. As the attack hit, Shino's insect labyrinth started to drop. Seeing that it was no longer needed, Shino released the jutsu. His charka being replenished a bit by the reptilian chakra his kikaichu drained from the snake. We did it! Shino confirmed, gasping slightly as the strain started to set in. Yeah, but we still got to get the tags back to Anko. Naruto informed his teammates. We have 20 minutes left, we better hurry, Hinata reminded them. The three teens grabbed their respective, Anko, tags. With their prize in hand they rushed back to the starting site of the test. As the teens leapt out of sight Mita brought her head up, cracking her, neck, slightly. What do you guy sssss think about the mistress's choice? She asked her siblings. I think they will be sssss satisfactory, Taro commented. I know the blonde hitsss hard enough, Mission stated, shaking his head slightly. With your thick sssss skull, I'm sss surprised. Mita teased her brother. We must inform Mistress Anko of the results. Taro interrupted her siblings before they could start bickering. Yes. The two siblings agreed, remembering why they had been summoned, with that they poofed away. With Anko Anko sat watching the timer click down. Just as the timer started to go off, her team landed. All of them panting hard, two of them sweating more than the third. You made it. Do you have the tags? Anko asked. Each team held up their respective tag, showing that they each had the one assigned to them. Very well done my young maggots. Anko congratulated them. Now, what was the true meaning of this test? Anko asked the teens. Teamwork. Hanada stated, finally regaining her breath, wiping sweat from her brow and face. Correct. How did you come to this? Anko inquired. Well the three tags were to make us split up and force us to face each one by ourselves. Shino started steadying out his ragged breathing. Yet, judging how Shino was barely dodging Mita's advances, yesterday, we figured that we couldn't take them on in single combat. Naruto continued. So we came up with a plan, draw the targets into a desired location, then trap and disable the targets. Hanada finished, nodding to her teammates. Naruto smiled broadly, while Shino smirked slightly. Excellent choices. Just remember, there are enemies out there that are stronger and more cunning, so we have to protect each other. If one of us should become wounded or fall in battle, now to never leave a comrade behind. Anko stated, looking down proudly at her team. Okay, enjoy the rest of your day maggots, cause tomorrow we'll start learning the art of the Midirashi torture sessions. Anko smiled broadly, an air of pain and suffering seeping from her. Be here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. We'll figure out a plan to improve you guys and then we'll take on some missions. Kia Sensei. The three genin answered, leaving the training ground. Next day, Kohonakager Mission Hall. Team 8 stood at attention of the Hokage, waiting for their first official mission. Anko, do you believe that your team is ready for a mission of their status? Serutobi asked the Jonin Sensei in a serious tone. I do, Hokage sama, Anko replied, standing at attention. Your first mission shall be. Hokage looked through the scrolls, Team 8 anticipating at what they might get. Take out a band of Rouge bandits, hunt down a Rouge shinobi, or escorting a high ranking official. All of these thoughts went through the young Genin's minds. Babysitting a council member's grandchildren, Serutobi stated. The looks on the faces of Team 8 were priceless. Naruto's eyes were wide with disbelief, Hanada was bewildered, and Shino had fell on to his ass in shock. Anko pulled out a camera and took a quick picture of her team's expressions. That's a keeper, ha ha ha, Anko told them laughing at her team. Several weeks later, Kohanakagor, Northern Park, this is Blondie, target spotted. I'd also have eyes on the target. Same, Anko pressed on the comm link, begin operation. After successful capture, confirm target. Hi. Three voice spoke. 
Suddenly there was a loud yowling, some cursing, and a couple poofs. Suddenly everything went silent. Target captured, confirmed target to be Tora. AKA, the demon cat of Kohanakagor. Hanada spoke into her calm link. Awesome. Let's go collect our pay, Enko told her team. Naruto and Shino's clothes were in tatters as Tora tried to claw the two teens to death. Hanada was about to paralyze the animal, only to be stopped by Anko. Now now my little maggots, no harming the pet of the fire daimo's wife, Anko told them, holding back the laughter of seeing her team be tormented by the demon cat. I swear if we have to catch this bitch again, I'm going to skin it and make a new loincloth, Naruto told her. Shino and Hanada nodding in agreement with their blonde teammate. Over the last couple of weeks the team had completed numerous D-rank missions, ranging from clearing fields to washing out the Inazaka dog kennels. These D-rank missions, were insults to Shinobi. These missions were no more than chores, that civilians were too lazy to complete on their own time. So they hired out Shinobi to complete the mundane tasks for them. Soon Team 8 entered the mission hall, still carrying the struggling Torah. As the cat was returned to the crushing grip of the fire Damino's wife, Team 8 couldn't but feel satisfaction at the torture of the animal. Dear Kami, Anko-sensei is starting to rub off on us, all three of the genins thought at the same time. Weeks of being around the insane sadistic Jonin had started to twist their way of thinking. Even the static Shino was starting to have a little more emotional expressions. They would start every day by meeting at training ground 44, or rather they started to call it home. Anko would then run them through team building exercises, consisting of a game of capture the flag to a high stake game of tag. The Jonin also started teaching them chakra control by forcing them to run up and down trees, while dodging kanai that Anko threw at them. If they were quick enough, they got away. If not, they received small nicks all over body. After an hour or two of this they broke off to do individual training that Anko had, prescribed, would be putting it loosely. Shino trained in physical endurance. Over the past couple of weeks, Mita and him had sprouted an interesting friendship. What started as Mita, hunting, the bug user, soon turned into the two competing with each other in races or games of tag. Hanada and Naruto would spar against the snake mistress and improve on the flaws each time. Enko started teaching Hanada how to introduce a more fluid set of moves into the Jukan form. Naruto would train by himself, learning more of the legendary dragon slaying art. He also started to work with his enhanced senses, blindfolding himself while he tracked different animals. Short to say, that the genin were far stronger than what they had been almost a month before. Shino had cut the sleeves on his jacket so that he had more movement, to make up for the loss of his jacket sleeves he wore a double layered long sleeve shirt. He also had a medium sized pouch on his back, containing specialized, goodies, for setting and distrutting traps. Naruto sported a silver and red short sleeve shirt that had a dragon's head stitched over the right side of the shirt. His pants were shorter than the usual, one side ended at his knee while the other reached mid thigh with leather strips crossing to reach down to his knee. Leather gauntlets covered his arms from his elbows to his hands, etched with what seemed to be dragon scales. Hanada had shedded her jacket, rather wearing a tight form fitting top that showed her toned stomach. Accompanying this was an opened purple coat that reached just above her backside. The bottoms, cut to shin length with leather straps crisscrossing down attaching to her footwear. Back to the moment at hand, Team 8 was now waiting for their next assignment. Rather praying to be released for the day so they could heal their wounds. Serutobi scanned the mission records for Team 8, as of today they had completed 35 D rank missions. It was 15 more than needed to take a C rank mission. Well, let's see. Ah, we have several more D rank missions that require our attention. You can help a farmer near the outskirts clear a field, walk the Inazaka's dogs, trim the trees around the Nara's deer farm, or babysit. Seru Tobi started to inform them of the missions. Fuck. That. Shit, Naruto stated. His teammates agreeing with the loud blonde. We are not doing any more fucking chores, the blonde told the aged Hokage. Naruto. You and your team are not ready for missions outside the village. There are certain restrictions that are placed so that fresh genin do not get killed in the line of duty. Uruka started to explain, his lecture mode starting. And that is why you will be doing D ranks until your Jonin sensei thinks you are capable of high rank missions. Uruka ended his lecture. 
Anko that was 2 centimeters off the mark, you have to give up Dango for 48 hours, Hanada told the Janin. What, I swore that it was dead on, Anko complained, the hurt of losing her favorite food crushing her. That seems like a wonderful idea to try out with the roast, what if you used sage rather than garlic? Shino asked, his mouth being wet from the recipe that the blonde commented on. Hmm, I actually didn't think about that, it would still keep the spark of the meat, without the extra heaviness, Naruto commented. Are you guys even listening? Uruka asked the group of insane shinobi. You were saying something Uruka? The group asked, to which Uruka's sweat dropped. I was saying. Uruka started again, only to be stopped by Anko. We know what you were saying Uruka-san, you just forget that they are no longer students, rather they are genin of Kohanakagur, under my leadership. So in the nicest possible way, fuck off. Anko told the shocked Chunin. But, but, Uruka started, only to be stopped again, this time by Serutobi. She is correct Uruka. They are no longer your students, you must let them go. Now, back to the task at hand. Team 8, do you think you are ready to be assigned a mission of a higher caliber? Serutobi asked. Hi, Hokage-sama. The team told him. Fine, this just came in. One of our own has turned traitor, stealing the forbidden scroll and fled to the north. You are to track the shinobi and retrieve the scroll. If possible capture the traitor and return him also. Serutobi told the team. What is the target's name? Anko asked the old man. Mizuki. Your target has a five hour lead. I suggest you hop to. Serutobi told them. Hi. The team replied. Okay. You guys have 10 minutes to grab your supplies and meet me at the northern gate. Even one second late, and you get to have a special training when we get back. Anko promised her team. North gate, five minutes later team eight all landed at the gate. Anko stood waiting for them, seeing that they were prepared for anything that was to happen. No time like the present. Let's go. Anko ordered the team, with that they took off after the trail of their prey. Naruto out front, his enhanced sense of smell holding the trail. Hanada was behind him, her Baikugan active. Shino was to the left of Hanada, while Anko was to the right. The team watched for traps that could have been set in case of pursuit. Even though their quarry had a head start on them, carrying such a load as the Forbidden Scroll would tire them. Soon the tracks showed fatigue, signs of rest here and there. Okay, we are 100 kilometers from the land of rice. He might be meeting someone as he has slowed. Anko informed her team. We need to be cautious, remember our objective is to obtain and return the Forbidden Scroll. If we can, capture the traitor Mizuki. If not, we must terminate him. The Genin nodded, knowing that one of them would have their first blood today. All of them were frightened, not knowing if today would be their last. Let's get ready. Anko told them, seeing that she could not prepare them any more than what she had. 50 kilometers from the border, land of fire, night. Night had fallen some hours ago. Mizuki was waiting by a river, his senses on high alert for any pursuit teams that might show up. My, my. So jumpy. A voice called from the other side of the river. I'm being cautious. My village would have sent a tracker team out after the scroll. Mizuki told the voice. A cloaked figure emerged from the tree line, hopping across the river. The figure landed in front of Mizuki. As promised I will escort you to the Odovikar. Once there you will be given the rank of Jonin when you turn over the forbidden scroll of Kohonagakar, the figure explained. Let's be off then. Mizuki told the figure, satisfied at the statement. Suddenly a volley of kanai and shuriken appeared from the other side of the river aimed at the two. The two quickly separated, being pushed back by the volley. You were followed. The figure told Mizuki. I was careful, I covered my tracks well. Mizuki informed the figure. Apparently they are well trained in the art of tracking, the figure replied. Suddenly Team 8 appeared, Hanada and Shino covered both sides of Mizuki while Anko and Naruto covered the cloaked figure. Mizuki for the theft of the Forbidden Scroll and the defection to the village of Otogakure. You have been charged with treason and are to be escorted back to the village of Kohanagakure. Or you can resist and be killed. Anko stated to the ex Chunin. Please resist, it's much more fun. Mizuki had his hands full defending against a more fluid style of Juken and dodging the Kakaichu from the Abarame. 
he had abandoned the four Biden scroll so that he could fight unburdened. Pulling the large shuriken off his back he threw it at the Aburame, forcing him to dodge. He then turned and focused on the Hayuga, this person being the more dangerous out of the two. The cloaked figure was easily dodging and evaded the close combat form of Anko who was using her improved hubby style Tiajutsu. Naruto supported her, waiting for an opening on the figure so that he could strike also. Suddenly the cloak snagged on a kanai that Naruto thrown at the figure. Anko saw this opening and went to strike, only to grab the cloak that was abandoned by the now recognizable female. She had bright red hair, that peeked out of a black skull cap the edge wrapped in bandages. Her attire was a simple brown tunic that went down to her knees, leather bracers on her forearms, black shorts, and her shins were wrapped in bandages. Damn bitch, that was my favorite cloak. You ass munching, cunt liquor. The woman told her. Wow, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? Anko asked the Otto Shinobi. Wouldn't you like to fucking know? Now shut up bitch, so I can take this sorry ass back to Otogakure. The woman told Anko. Uh, no now be a good girl and run back to your leader and tell him to fuck off. Anko told the woman. My leader, huh? He would be so disappointed in you. Seeing as you haven't even tried to use your curse seal yet, the woman insulted Anko. Anko flinched at what the woman said, that was all the time the red head needed to jump back and produce a flute from her pouch. Now enjoy the music, bitch, the woman stated, then started to play a melody on the flute. Upon hearing the sounds Anko froze as the flute user phased out of existence. Naruto wasn't doing any better as his acute hearing made the effect even worse. Suddenly a shock of energy was sent through the two. Hanada stood panting, a hand on each of their shoulders. Her Byakugan was active as she had felt the effects of a genjutsu being cast. Naru-kun, trade out with me. If she is using a flute to cast genjutsu then she can't deal with up-close attacks. I'm an ideal opene for her. Anko-sensei back me up. Hanada planned out quickly. No, the bitch has to answer some question I have. You back me up. Anko told the Hayuga. But I thin. Hanada started. That's an order Genin. Anko ordered the Hayuga. TCH, fine. I'll provide support. Hanada responded not happy at the order. Naruto looked over and saw that Shino was having a some difficulty fighting the armed Shunin. Just as a giant shuriken was about to pierce Shino's back, Naruto blocked it with his bracers. The shuriken cut into the bracers, the tips on the weapon started breaking. What? How are you destroying my weapons? Mizuki asked pulling the damaged giant shuriken back with the ninja wire he had attached to it. Beat us and you'll find out. Shino, which tactic should we use? Naruto asked the bug user. Gamma Echo, that one should do nicely, Shino told the blonde. Are you sure? Gamma Echo is hard on my chakra right now, Naruto reminded the Aburame. I know, I just need to get a few of my insects on him. Shino informed him. Gamma Echo it is. Just give me a second, you know I gotta get ready. Naruto told him, and started to channel chakra. Shino rushed the chunin, slashing with a kanai and dodging the giant shuriken that was now being wilded in the rogue shinobi's hands. After about a half a minute of going back and forth with the chunin, Shino jumped up into the air. Mizuki stared at a tornado that was spinning towards him. He held up his giant shuriken blocking most of the wind. The tornado pushed him back into a tree and started to compress him into it. Suddenly as if a balloon had deflated, the wind suddenly stopped. Bringing his shuriken down, he saw that Naruto was panting with shortness of breath. Pulling the giant shuriken back, Mizuki started to throw the weapon. Shino suddenly appeared in front of the chunin. Mizuki switched targets, slicing into the Aburame. The shinobi suddenly burst into thousands of insects, which covered the rouge chunin. A few seconds later the bugs swarmed back to their user. Now we can get out of here. Shino grabbed the scroll and start heading back. I'll tie up the teme here, then I'll get Anko and Hinata. Naruto told his teammate, pulling out ninja wire and a chakra sealing tag. Shino nodded, retrieved the scroll and went a ways from the battlefield. With Anko and Hinata, after the trade out Anko rushed the red head, striking at her face. The woman dodged the blows trying to bring her flute up. Anko produced a kanai, catching the flute as it came to the user's lips. Pulling back, the snake mistress relieved the woman of her weapon. 
Now you have to fight in close combat, cunt, Enko told the redhead. That's fine, I'm the second best out of my group, four of the best in the village made by your former master, the woman informed her. We'll see after you fight us, a voice to the side told her. The woman dodged her head back as a strike came into view, flipping back. As the red head flipped, she struck out with her feet catching Hinata on the side of her jaw, causing the Hyuga to spin away. Anko struck at the woman as she came out of her flip, just before she stabilized herself, being caught off guard. The shinobi rolled as she fell back, lessing the damage. It still hurt though, the strike already starting to bruise. Fuck, I need to get the hell out of here. The woman told herself, she then started to head towards the river. Dragon Slayer Arts. Dragon Flare. A voice called out, suddenly she was blinded by a bright flash of light. Suddenly, the woman couldn't move anymore. Falling forward, her face rushed to the ground. Right as the tip of her nose touched the ground she stopped. Now now Hinaheim, just cause she got a lucky hit doesn't mean you should let her fall on her nose. A voice told the Hyuga. Well it hurt. Hanada pouted to the voice. We'll take her back to Kohanagakir. Anko commanded the voice. Hi, hi. I already put a chakra sealant on her, the voice told Anko. Suddenly she was turned to face a set of deep blue eyes, and a soft smile. Above the blue eyes was a mess of light blonde mixed with a steely gray. Three whisker marks adorned the cheeks on either side of the eyes and smile. The woman bulked, adverting her eyes slightly. Might I ask your name? The whiskered individual asked. Okay. Gag it is. The individual told her as he produced a white cloth out of his scroll. The scroll was labeled, Capture and Torture Tools. He then gagged her with the cloth. The woman shocked a little upon seeing the label on the scroll. Noticing he turned a shade whiter than what she had been a moment ago, looked at the label. Ah, don't worry. I'm not gonna torture you. I don't hurt women. My himes on the other hand, that's their own story. Now up we go. The boy told the red-headed woman as he pulled her up into a bridal style. Anko, we need to hurry. She might have back up nearby. Let's get back to the village. The boy suggested to Anko. Hi, hi. Let's get out of here. Anko ordered. I smell snakes Naruto thought to his family. Yep, it's coming from her strongly. It is also coming from about 5 kilometers north of here. Igniel informed his niece San. Naruto nodded to himself, keeping the information till they were in safer territory. Team 8 started back the way they came. Anko and Naruto in front with the prisoners, Hanada behind them watching with her by Kugan, with Shino behind her leaving his insects here and there. The red head just watched the blonde's face as he jumped through the trees. She had never seen someone so determined, yet at the same time so comforting. The last time she saw a look like that, the leader of her village had come to her home and took her away from her mother. They had been having dinner, her and her sister were laughing at a joke their mother had just told them. Then suddenly their world had been turned upside down. Shaking her head of the memory, she started to focus on how to get out of this situation. Menatali slapping herself for not learning how to control her curse mark beforehand, rather wanting to prove her worth before gaining more strength. Now, she had been captured by a bunch of tree huggers and were being taken back to their village. She had told her leader that they needed to kill the traitor and just take the scroll. But no, the stupid fuck wanted another body in his fuck jobbed army. Soon she felt the enemy shinobi start to slow. Finally they landed in a clearing about two hours away from where they had first started. Shino, set traps and fan your insects out. Naruto, get some food. No fires, we are still on a mission and not out of danger just yet. Berries and jerky should do fine. There is a stream nearby, Hanada fill the canteens. After that help me with dumpster mouth here. Enko distributed orders out. Her team nodded and went to their tasks. Now, I'm going to remove your gag. If you even think of doing anything, other than answering my questions. I will cut out your tonuge and eat it in front of you. Do I make myself clear? Anko asked the woman. The red head just cocked an eyebrow. The look said, Really, that all you got? Or I could have Naruto come back here and talk to you. He is very influential. I mean the way he looks at you with those ocean blue eyes, and that smart Alec grin that knows everything. I know you know what I'm talking about, that look you gave him earlier. Before you saw his tools. Anko commented. She didn't tell the woman that she had also seen the looks that she had given the blonde while they had been traveling. 
MMMMHHHHMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMM
The prison cells are not as nice as outside is. Anko informed the woman. Naruto's mind sitting down in the middle of the plateau, he looked at the scroll in his hand. While they had taken a short break, he had placed a bushen of skiadrum on the forbidden scroll. The shadow dragon had slipped in between the rolls on the scroll and was now currently copying as much as he could to Naruto's mentality. Cage Bushin, a rank jutsu, allows the user to make single to mutable copies of themselves that have chakra and are solid. These copies can be used for spying and information gathering. As when dispelled they will return the memories to the original. Naruto read off to the others. I remember Kashina being able to make dozens of those to confuse her opponents and find weaknesses. Kayubi reminisces Ed. That sounds worth investing some time in. Igniel commented. It does sound useful, and if you mixed our energies in with them. This might be the answer to our problem, at least a temporary solution, Grandine stated. If we take this and figure out a way to combine it with the Hake no Fuan Shiki, we might be able to allow you guys to have a more permanent body, Naruto informed them. An interesting idea, we could have solid bodies yet still be part of your essence, Metallicon amused. It'll take a few years, but if I can get the cage bushin down, then we could figure it out in months. Naruto told his companions. It'll take time, but soon I can be surrounded by my family. Edo Tensai, who would want to bring back a lifeless shell whose will is bent to the summoner's own? Wysolohia asked in a disgusted tone. I don't know, but that one can be put away in the back. We can probably find a way to counter it. Naruto explained, before turning back to the scroll which had numerous jutsus on it already. Looking over he saw several that interested him, Hachiman, Fury no Kami, Sozo Saisei, and Rasengan. Naruto started reading, four hours later. Naruto rolled over and came face to face with an ample sized chest, looking up he saw that the chest belonged to Tiyuya. The red head had fell asleep a few hours ago next to a tree, but over the hours she had tossed and turned, somehow maneuvering her way to his side. Anko sat in silent laughter at her blonde squad member, being stuck between the two Kunoichi as he had slept. Naruto glared at the snake mistress, you could have done something. And miss seeing your priceless face when you woke up, nah, I don't think so, Enko replied laughing. Naruto gently removed himself from between the two women. They snuggled closer together, the sudden absence of warmth making them seek out the closest heat source. Naruto pinched his nose so he did not have a massive nosebleed all over his shirt. Shino looked on away from the situation though there was a small bit of blood coming from his nose. Naruto-san, you seem to get in the most peculiar situations, Shino informed the blonde. Nah you think? Naruto retorted. Do you want to wake them? Or should one of us did? Anko asked, looking at the two snuggled women. Shino and Naruto looked at each other then looked over at the still unconscious Mizuki, they then looked back at each other with a sadistic smile. With Hinata and Tuyuya the two women were unaware of their situation until a sudden force was felt upon them. Both women awoke and hit the force with attacks. Hinata striking out with a Jukan strike and Tuyuya with a headbutt. Sitting up they saw a battered Mizuki laying in front of them and three Kohanagakir shinobi laughing hard. Naruto, sweetheart, did you throw an unconscious rouge shinobi on me while I was sleeping? Hinata asked, her aura seeping into a demonic looking figure behind her. Suddenly Enko placed a hand on her shoulder. If you knock him out, one of us will have to take the extra weight, Enko explained, to the pissed Kunoichi. I'd do it to the prick sucker if I wasn't like this. Tuyuya informed the two women, glaring daggers at the blonde. Oh come on guys, lighten up. It's not like the Teme is gonna turn into a weird hybrid tiger human. Naruto told the two female teens. Where the hell did you get an idea like that? The two asked. Anyways, let's finish this up, I would like to have a nice shower tonight, Enko informed her team. Yeah, I want some beef ramen. Tons of beef. Naruto drooled, the dragon's love of meat showing a little. My insects need to be replenished, Shino stated. I have a new baking recipe I want to try, Hanada informed the group. Do we get to be guinea pigs? Enko asked, cocking an eyebrow. My father will not allow me to test the recipes on the family members anymore. Anko you should know that if I don't like it, I won't make it for anyone else. Hanada explained to the snake woman. Nodding, Anko grabbed Mizuki. She threw him over her shoulder, the woman then turned to her team. 
Naruto was holding Tuyuya in a bridal style hold, Hanada had the scroll on her back, Shino had just finished collecting his traps. An hour later, Land of Fire, 50 kilometers from Kohanagakure. The team had been making good time even with the extra weight. Suddenly Naruto flinched as something entered his range of hearing. Dodging to the left a golden colored kanai lodged into the tree where his head had just been. Ambush! Naruto yelled, dodging numerous kanai that had been released. TCH, I told you were too early, a gravely voice called out. And how would you have known? You have poorer aim than I do, plus I wanted to see if he could come up to my level, another voice replied. Stop it, both of you, before I kill you, a new stern monotone voice told the two. A group of four shinobi appeared, they had the same outfit on that Tuyuya had on, only slightly different for each one. There was a large teen with a triple orange mohawk, sporting a sleeveless brown tunic, and his brown bottoms ended right below his knees. A large grayish purple rope like belt could be seen around his waist, the bow inverted at the back. The second teen was a thin tan man with moody pule arms, a gray sleeveless tunic with a black sleeveless shirt and black shorts under it. A purple rope like belt around his waist, the inverted bow in the back. His hair was pulled back into a rough ponytail, a otogakure protector on his forehead. The next teen was a bluish gray haired, with some type of growth coming from the back. The teen had on greenish lipstick and light mascara around the eyes. The teen also sported a prayer bead type necklace. The gray haired person's attire consisted of a brown tunic with a black shirt under it, black arm warmers, and black shorts. The legs were covered in bandages, and finally, a giant scroll was being carried behind the back through the loop of the rope like belt. The final teen was a pale, thinly tall teen, with shoulder length white hair that was zigzagged parting in the middle and pulled into two ponytails on either side of his head. He had two scarlet dots on either side of his forehead. His attire consisted of a loose light lavender shirt that zipped up and had long sleeves. His bottoms were black pants that were cut off at mid calf a purple rope belt tied around his waist with an inverted bow in the back. What are you fuckers doing here, aren't you supposed to be at the fucking village? Tuyuya asked in a surprised tone. Leader Sama had us follow after you and make sure you were to arrive back on time. You have not, so we came to fetch you. The white-haired teen informed Tuyuya. It wasn't my fault, I got captured by the tree fuckers. Tuyuya explained, shaking her head at Team 8. Sensei, what do we do now? We can't fight them like this, and the village is too far away to make a retreat. Hanada asked, noting that the situation they were in. We are gonna have to retreat, it's all we can do really. We are just unlucky, they had caught us on the way back to the village. Enko informed her team. Naruto said to Yuya down on the limb, leaning her back against the tree. He then stood and started cracking his neck. You guys head on. I want to try something out. Naruto informed his team. Hanada appeared next to him placing Tuyuya on her back. Naru kun, if you don't come back, I'll hunt you down, kill you, then bring you back to life and kiss you hard. Hanada told the blonde in a sweet tone, a dark aura around the girl. That goes double for me. Anko told him. Hi Haim. Naruto answered, before cracking his knuckles and doing a few hand signs. Move now. Dragon Slayer Arts. Dragon Wind Drill. Naruto ordered as he blew a tight inverted funnel at the four teens. Three of the teens quickly moved out of the way. The white-haired teen stood still as the drill-like funnel hit next to him, destroying part of the, the branch the group had been standing on. Interesting. The boy said in the same calm monotone voice, I shall be your opponent. Actually I wanted to take all of you on at once. I guess the others are a bunch of pussies that couldn't be to fly away. Naruto goaded the group of teens. If that is what you wish, then it shall be. Try not to die too quickly on us. The white haired boy told Naruto. Naruto's enhanced hearing caught the hissing sound of something being thrown. Dodging, he reached out and grabbing a white hardened arrow. Bringing the projectile up, he studied it slightly, before throwing it back the way it came. The multi limbed teen moved his head slightly, the arrow plunging into the tree where his head had just been. Shocked that the teen had not only caught his arrow, but also thrown it back with almost pinpoint accuracy. TCH, damn it. He might be more fun than I thought at the beginning. The multi limbed teen spoke out loud, starting to chew on something. Naruto didn't have a chance to retaliate, 
as the huge teen appeared in front of him. The teen thrust his hand forward hitting Naruto in the chest. Naruto flew through the air and slamming into the trunk of a tree. Ouch, that hurt a little you punk, Naruto told the large teen. Hmm, you are alive. I hit you with enough force to break one of these trees, the teen told him. I guess I'm just lucky, Naruto said smiling at the teen. So, who's next? Naruto asked, balling his hands into fists, his eyes starting to turn into slits, and his irises turning a golden red color. His blood had started pumping hard, his breath coming in short. A roar started to thunder in the back of his mind, the call started rising into a torrent. Dragon Slayer Art, Metal Storm. Naruto yelled, Metal Shrapnel started spinning around the blonde pushing outward. Shit! Was all the big teen could say before receiving cuts and nicks from the metal-infused tornado. The teen had crossed his arms in front of his face, blocking most of the debris from hitting his face. Lowering his arms the teen looked behind him, the trees looked as if they had been thrown through a stripper that had been left on too long, it almost looked like a string cheese stick, half strung. He's almost at our level, the multi-armed teen spoke out. I want to eat him, he seems like a tasty meal, the big teen told the multi-armed teen. Jirobo, you always are hungry. Kitamaru, we don't have time to play, the white-haired teen told his teammates. Wait a minute. Fat, weird, pale. Where's the hunchback? Naruto asked, looking at his opponents. He was short on breath, he felt his chakra being drained from the high ranked jutsu. Oh, Sakan. He went after your team, guess one of us got away. The white teen informed him, coughing slightly. Well, I'm just the motherfucking decoy. Naruto told the three, before throwing two balls of light up into the branches. Dragon Slayer Art, Dual Dragon Flare. Naruto called out as both lights exploded, blinding the teens. In the moments that it took to clear the teens to clear their vision, Naruto had already shot off in pursuit of the other teen. What do we do now Kimimaro? Jirobo asked, looking at the white-haired teen. If we pursue them we have the chance at being caught, we must cut our losses. Let us head back to Orochimaru-sama and inform him of what has occurred. Kimimaro told the two teens that were left. Nodding at the truth, the three teens retreated, leaving to inform Orochimaru of the events that had transpired, and to plan their next move towards Kohanagakure. With Team 8, 30 kilometers from Kohanagakure, shit, can this guy get any more annoying? Anko asked, having dodged another strike that had broke the limb she had been on. The fucker could get more fucking annoying, Tuyuya commented to Anko. Bitch either shut up, or fucking give some useful information, Anko told the teen. Okay. Hey Sakin, you dumb fucker. Hurry up and get me out of here. Tayuya told the teen. Tayuya, I might want to kill you, after I take out this trash. Sakin informed the redhead. Tayuya visibly flinching at what the teen had told her, she knew that the teen wanted to prove that they were stronger than anybody else. The only person so far to beat them was the group's current leader Kimimaro. Shino, Hanada. Head to the village and send reinforcements, I'll hold this one off. Anko informed them, pulling out two kanai and getting set into an advance hubby form. Well, well, one of the trash wants to play, sorry, we don't have time. We are on a strict schedule. Sakan informed the snake mistress. You'll just have to reschedule then. Cause I'm gonna make you an appointment right now. Anko retorted at the teen. Sakan scoffed lightly, rushing into the snake Jonan's personal space. The teen brought both hands up and slammed them down towards the woman's head. Being forcibly stopped short before Anko's head, a sudden pain sprouted from the teen's arms. Fuck, damn bitch stuck us. Sakan spoke out, two more arms appeared pulling the kanai out of the teen's arms. Are we gonna have to switch, you know I was sleeping. A different voice sounded from the teen. Do you have like a split personality or something? Anko asked the teen. Huh. Oh the woman is asking about you. Sakan told the voice, suddenly the growth on the teen's back moved to the shoulder. She is? Well we better not keep her waiting. The growth spoke again, starting to pull itself off and into a humanoid form. Just what are you? Anko asked the teen and humanoid figure in a bewildered tone. We are fraternal twins. Meet Yukon, my older brother. Sakan introduced the humanoid figure. This is Sakan, 
My younger sister. Yukon introduced in turn. Holy shit. So if you're a girl and your brother, rests, inside you. Does that mean you are like a? Oh, what's the word? Anko asks, then dodges Sakan throwing a kanai at her. Ah, I remember, a hermaphrodite? The snake Jonan asks the two, slamming her fist on her open palm. The siblings freeze, then looked at one another. Turning back to the Jonan, the twins each sported a look of rage. Sakan having more of a blush mixed with the rage. You bitch. Yukon yells, punching at the snake mistress. Anko dodges expertly, the shockwave from the punch breaking a tree that was a few meters behind the Jonan. Hey, it was a serious question. I mean, I know that if you put a normal male inside a female, said female will get pregnant. But if a male merges with a female, does that not make them a hermaphrodite? Anko teased the two Otobakir shinobi. No we do not form a hermaphrodite when we rest in the other. Sakan informed the Kohanagakir shinobi. Oh, that's good. Cuz I was about to pull out so many jokes about you guys in the bathroom it wouldn't have even been funny. Anko retorted at the twins. We're gonna kill you, bitch, Yukon yelled, rushing forward slamming his fist into the Jonan's stomach, only to be caught by the woman. Hey big brother, save some for me. Sakan told her older brother, appearing behind Anko, swinging her fist into the snake mistress's head. Suddenly Sakan's fist came into contact with a hard metal surface. Her fist came into contact with several pops and cracks. Yanking her hand back and making some distance to start recovering, did she notice that the surface was a metal-covered arm that connected to the teen that had stayed behind? Here sis, try and hurry. I'm not used to being the main body. Yukon told Sakan, allowing her to merge with him. What the hell is their problem? Naruto asked Anko. Well to put it simply, one of them can merge with the other and apparently heal themselves. Anko explained to the newly arrived blonde. What? If one is a guy, and the other is a girl, wouldn't that make them? Naruto started to ask. A hermaphrodite? I know, I asked the same question. Anko informed the blonde. Did they answer? Oh, Kami. I just thought of all the joke I could do right now. Naruto told the Jonin. I was about to ask them about their bathroom habits, but they attacked before I could. Anko replied. I wonder if when the chick has her period, does the other feel it or what? Naruto asked the twins. Fuck you. Sakan, we have wasted too much time here. The others probably have retreated. Let's get the fuck out of here and get back to the village. Yukon told his sister. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let me sleep for a bit, then I'll take back over. Sakan replied drowsily to her brother. Yukon nodded at his sister, then fleeing the way Naruto had came. Naruto started to go after them. Only to be stopped by Anko, who had grabbed his shoulder. Our mission is the retrival of the Forbidden Scroll and Mizuki. It's a bonus that we got the Auto Shinobi. Anko explained to the battle ready blonde. The calling was pushing him to rush after the fleeing enemy. To fight them till only one was left standing. That push is what had forced the Dragon Slayers of old to grow in strength quickly. Naruto was a shinobi of Kohanagakir though, he had a mission to complete. Shaking his head, Naruto pushed the calling down, he pushed it into the back of his mind, forcing himself to calm down. Anko was right, it would be a waste to chase them. The blonde might end up sustaining major or even life-threatening injuries. You win this time Habiheim. Let's go home, Naruto told the snake Jonan. With that the two shinobi jumped into the foliage and raced home only slowing down when they saw the northern gate to the village. Anko Mitarashi, Jonan sensei of Team 8. Anko announced to the gate guards. Naruto Uzumaki, Genin student of Team 8. Naruto also informed the gate guards. Both guards looked up, checking their shinobi identas real quick. Glad you guys made it back, the rest of your team is over at IT with the traitor and prisoner. We were about to send a squad of Anbu out to retrieve you. One of the guards informed the shinobi. Thanks, can you tell the two other genin to meet us at the Hokage's office, so we can be debriefed? Anko asks one of the guards, who nods and went over to short range ham radio. Kohanagakir IT, this is the North Guard. Team 8's a Jonin sensei and spare genin have returned. The Jonin sensei wishes for the rest of the team to meet at the Hokage's office for debrief. Copy. The guard talks into the walkie. Copy. 
Team 8 is to report to the Hokage's office for debrief. Tell Anko that if she wants first crack at this Otobakir shinobi, she needs to move fast, the voice replied. She already left, and judging by the dust cloud headed to the Hokage's office. You'll see her in about 15 to 20 minutes. The guard replied, looking at a long straight dust cloud that lead to the Hokage's office. Hokage's office Anko kicked the door open, and threw Naruto into the office. The other members of Team 8 arriving just before their Jonin sensei. Sorry for the late arrival. A hermaphrodite tried to assimilate us into themselves and we had to fight back. Anko announced to the room. What? Sarutobi asked. Oh, sorry too far ahead. Let's start at the beginning. Anko said blinking slightly, then started to go over the mission report. Ah, now I understand. Sarutobi said, sitting back in his chair. He carefully light his pipe. The smell of a sweet smoke lifted into the air and swirled around the room. So this female Otogakir shinobi is part of this group that is supposedly the strongest shinobi in that village. Due to her being laid back from her assignment, they sent the rest of her group out after her. Who you engaged and then retreated from to complete the mission assigned to you. Sarutobi summarized. Hi Hokage-sama. Judging how the Herma, the shinobi that engaged me, their strength and techniques were on par with my own. I judged that they would be high chunin to high janin. Anko commented to the Hokage. Sarutobi nodded, then closed his eyes in thought for a moment. Then grabbing a pen and the mission scroll, Sarutobi made some extra marks before stamping it with his seal. I have upgraded the mission from a C rank to an A rank due to the effect of this group of Otogakir shinobi's strength. Sarutobi informed Team 8, handing the scroll back to Anko to turn in. With that I'll give Team 8 a 48 hour leave, I'll see you in two days at the mission hall. Dismissed. Sarutobi told the group. Hi, Hokage-sama. The team voiced, bowing before leaving. I wonder what you are up to Orochimaru. Sigh, I'm getting too old for this. Sarutobi told no one in particular. With team 8. Okay guys, the Hokage has given us a 48 hour leave. I'll let you guys rest or do whatever you kids do these day. I've got a date with an auto shinobi that requires a candlelights and soft music. Naruto. Take care of this for me would ya? Anko told the team before rushing off towards the IT department. Throwing the signed mission scroll to Naruto, who started to walk off toward the mission hall with the rest of his team. Let's get this put away then take off guys. Naruto commented to his team, who nodded in return. As they were heading into the mission hall, Team 7 was heading out of the hall. The two teams almost bumped into one another. Hey Naruto, are you going to be coming over tonight? Mom wants to know if you want fried chicken or pot stickers? Sasuke asked the blonde. Yeah, I'll head over there after we turn this in and get changed into some clean clothes. I'll take some pot stickers. Hanada, would you like to join us? Naruto asked the dark haired girl. Uh, I think my father wants to talk to me about something. I'll have to pass this time. Hanada informed the blonde. And what important D rank mission did you have that you were missing for an entire day? Kakashi asked the teens. That is privileged information. If you wish to know more, then you'll have to ask Anko sensei. Shino told the cycloptic Jonin. Hmm. Kakashi said, pulling his orange book back up to his face. We'll see ya later. Naruto told Team 7, as his team headed into the mission hall. Cave of Ceiling, Lightning Country a click and hiss were all that was heard from back room. The woman that had been the second to be unsealed walked to the back hoping the coffin that held her adopted daughter had opened. Looking in, she saw that the blank black coffin is the one that was opening. A young man dressed in a high-collared red and tan robes with gold trim stepped out. A large white toga was draped from his left shoulder down to his right hip. His black hair was cut to the nape of his neck, and flowed slightly over his ears. The bangs on the front parted in two parts so that his eyes could look out onto the world. His final setting was he had a pendant around his neck, what was in it only the wearer knew. Good morning. Is it time already? The man asked the woman. Yes, it is my lord. What are your wishes? The woman asked, the robed man. I've told you many times Ultir, not to call me lord or sama, or any honorifics. It is to many years late for me to have earned respect. We are here to serve justice umong those who wish ill upon this new world. The dark-haired man informed her. I'm sorry Emil. Zarif. Where shall we start? 
Ultir asked Zarif. I sense several powerful energies coming from the west. It also seems to be tainted with great evil, as if a demon from hell itself has been produced. Zarif informed her. Send Zancro. Have Eric find us a proper area to set up a base. Your will be done, Lord Zarif. Ultir told the dark haired man, bowing. Lord Zarif, when will my daughter become unsealed? Ultir asking the man, worried about the only member of the group that matters to her. Hum, she will be along any day now. Now, where is our host? Zarif informed Ultir, asking for the man as he walked out the door. Ultir stood, before stepping up to the coffin engraved with a heart on it. She gingerly touched the lid, kissing it gently. She then turned and walked out of the room to relay the orders to the flaming god slayer and the poisonous dragon slayer. The thirteen unopened coffins laying in waiting to be awoken to the new world. Southern border in the land of fire, cavern and unexplored cavern shut off from the rest of the world suddenly flashed in a dazzling light, that then deposited several characters into its darkness. Damn it, that hurt. Is everyone here? A male voice asked. I think so, where are we? A feminine voice replied. Lucy, I think we did it. Lucy? A pink-haired man asked, looking around. I don't think she made it, Natsu, the female voice told the pink-haired man. We knew what would happen if she sent us forward, I just never thought, the man said, leaving the ending hanging. Natsu, let's not hold on to what could have been. We need to get out of here and gather our bearings. An older man told Natsu, who in return nodded. I wonder if the world has completely forgotten us. Natsu told the group as they started to look for an exit to the cavern. The two days of leave for Team 8 had been welcoming, yet the leave had also ended too quickly for them. They now stood in front of the Hokage again, waiting for their next mission. We've received rumors of large tremors in the southern area of the Land of Fire. We want you to go down and see what is making these. If it is beast like, stop it or incapacitate it. If it is a humanoid, try to reason with it or capture it. The aged man assigned them. Hi Hokage sama. The team replied. Okay guys, pack for one week. Enko told her team, we'll be leaving in a half hour. I wonder what's going to be waiting for us, Naruto asked his team. I don't know, but we must be prepared for anything. Shino confirmed what his teammates had been thinking. Naruto went to the shinobi tailor that had made all his outfits. Walking in it didn't seem like a tailor's shop. The interior seemed more like an outlet clothing store for shinobi. Second-hand pieces and discount racks hung all over the place. The blonde walked up to the counter and rung the bell twice. An elderly man came from the back, looking up to the, the young shinobi. He smiled broadly as he approached the boy. Suddenly the man started to move his hands. To anyone else it would look like he was flapping his hands around and touching his face as if he was having a seizure. It had took Naruto years to realize the man was actually talking to him. Ah, Master Naruto. You have come for your gauntlets, the repairs went nicely. I am ashamed that you let the gauntlets get damaged like that, the man said with his hands. I am deeply sorry, Shinmoku asterisk. I had to use my special gift to keep them from getting totally destroyed. You do know what happens in our line of business, Naruto informed the man. I am aware of your line of work. I mended the gauntlets and reinforced the leather with a metal plating. I also added a lining of sealing arrays. You can place anything from kanai to a person into those seals. Shinmoku informed him. What about our special product? Naruto asked him, looking around to if anyone non-important around. Ah, the special product. The only problem with that is the materials are almost legendary. Do you know how hard it is to find that object, even if the object is found? The price to obtain it is almost as hard as finding it. The elderly tailor told him, but I am close to finding it. I would like to be informed when you do find it, as I am the only one in the world that can obtain it without paying the ultimate price. Naruto informed the elder. Hi, hi. I will inform you ASAP, Master Naruto. Now, do you require anything else? The man asked through his hands. Just the price for the repairs and upgrades on the gauntlets. Naruto told told him, holding up a wallet that looked like a fox with dragon scales starting around midway. I've told you when we find, that object you'll have been paid in full now run along the man told him okay thanks 
Naruto told the man as he grabbed the improved gauntlets and head to the door. South Gate, ten minutes prior to departure Naruto arrived just as Hinata and Shino were lighting onto the ground just inside the gate. The hyperactive blonde checked his scrolls and his armor for what seemed to be the fifteenth time since they all arrived at the gate. Naruto-san, no offense, could you please stop messing with your equipment, Shino exclaimed. Wow Shino, all you had to do was say please. Naruto retorted, setting his armor back to the original setting that he had it set to. Naruto, are you okay? Hinata asked perturbedly, her fingers poking slightly together, the blonde's energy causing the team to sense an air of foreboding. I don't know, it's this aura that is coming from the south, it's as if I know it. Naruto explained, visibly trying to relax. He took a deep breath and centered himself. I'll try to keep this feeling to a minimum. I'll try not to let it get too close to the heart. Naruto confirmed with his team. Anko suddenly approached as Naruto cut his intent down to a lower level. She noticed that her team was on edge from the blonde's aura leaking on a subconscious level. Okay guy, I've got a week's worth of dango. A large supply of kanai thanks to Naruto making those new storage seals for me. Anko informed her team. No offense sensei, but don't you think that consuming that much sugar is good for you in the long run? Shino asked, curiously. Anko struck a thinking pose for what seemed a half second. Nah, not unless they put me teaching the academy or some boring job like being the Hokage's secretary. Anko replied, Now, are we ready to begin the mission? Hi, Sensei. Team 8 sounded off as they turned to the gate. Okay, team, let's move out. I want to be halfway to the destination in a day, so we'll be moving quick and high paced. The snake mistress told her team. Let's get going, you talk too much, Naruto informed the purple-haired Jonin, causing the said Jonin's eyebrow to twitch ever so slightly. Damn it Naruto, if I didn't care about you so much, the Jonin let the sentence hanging as team aide departed for the southern destination, unknowingly setting off to something that would change their perspective on the shinobi world as they knew it. Three days later, southern part of the land of fire, team aide approached the crevice slowly, ready for anything that might approach. Naruto had become anxious as they had approached the southern point of the land of fire. Naruto, are you sure that you don't want to be the supporting role for this? Hinata asked for the fifth time, she was worried for her blonde lover. He seemed to start changing as they had moved further and further toward the south. Haim, I told you I was fine the first day and the second day. I promise that I'm fine. Naruto confirmed with a large smile on his face. Okay, Naruto. Go check the crevice. Anko ordered the blonde. Hi. Naruto replied, placing his calm link around his neck. The blonde shinobi snuck up to the crevice, looking down he didn't notice anything. A slight tremor ran through the ground, shaking the genin slightly. Nothing at the edge, I'm heading down. Naruto spoke over his calm link. I see a massive energy down at the bottom, to the left side of the crevice. With each tremor, the tremor moves closer to the crevice. Hinata replied, to the right of Naruto. My insects tell me that it's something that they had never felt before, Shino also commented. All right my lil team of Genin, let's go see what it is, last one to the bottom has to buy lunch. Anko told them, then jumped off the edge of the crevice. Fuck, I ain't losing again. Last time, the mods vacated my wallet. Naruto commented, jumping after the insane Janin. Hinata and Shino followed suit, running down the wall. Anko was about 10 meters from the bottom when a large chunk of the cliffside busted out. A dust cloud appeared around the opening. Quickly she slapped her calm link to inform her team about the danger. Cut the bet, something just busted out, Anko told them. Good, I was getting bored. Naruto replied, landing with his lightly on his feet due to the added effect of the dragon slayer art. We need to be cautious, they might be really strong, Shino commented, being the voice of semi-reason. I've been dying to try the new juke and move on something, please let there be a scuffle, Hinata chipped in. Suddenly a voice came from the cloud of dust, damn, can't see a thing. Who are you? Anko asked seriously towards the group that appeared out of the cloud, pulling out two kanai into her hands readying for an attack. A few moments before team 8 arrived, Ga. Why won't this wall bust? Natsu asked frustrated. Why can't we use our magic? 
It seems that this world doesn't contain an abundant of magical energy like ours did. Gajil informed him, biting into a piece of iron. Well we need to get out of here before we starve, I mean the dragon slayers can eat their own elements for a limited time before they to succumb to hunger. Wendy informed the group panting slightly, plus I'm starting to lose the magical energy that I had stored up. You know what? I'm sick of being in this cave, you said that this was the weakest point? Natsu asked pointing at the end of the tunnel. Yes, the air is freshest from there. Wendy commented, feeling the air just out of the group's reach. Time for an overcharge. Natsu told the group, cracking his knuckles. Duck? Gajil asked. Yeah that might be a good idea. Natsu replied as he cocked back his arms. Dragon Slayer Art. Rampage Mode. Natsu called out, as he started slamming his fists into the wall. After a few seconds the walls started to shake violently. Almost there. Just one more push. Natsu yelled to the group, as he hammered away. Suddenly the wall crumbled and exploded outward, creating a large dust cloud that covered the bottom of the ravine. Damn, can't see a fucking thing. Gajil told the group, then suddenly he tensed, sensing something just outside the dust cloud. Who are you? A voice rang out as the cloud started to settle. As the view cleared the group noticed another group of four people, three teenagers and one adult standing across from the hole in the wall. You'll get a name, when you tell your name, Natsu informed the people. Suddenly the blonde-haired teen sniffed the air slightly, he then shot forward towards Natsu. Gajil jumped in front of him, his hands turning into an iron limbs, dragon slayer art, metal bombardment asterisk. He then started striking at the blonde, who to the metal dragon slayer's surprise, dodged every single strike. Still in the line of his target, who had yet to move. Wendy emerged from the tunnel to see a blonde teen bring his fist up with wind coating it. Shocked by this, she rushed in front of Natsu and drew in a large breath. Dragon Slayer Art Breath of the Wind Dragon Asterisk. Wendy called out as she let forth a blast of air that hit the blonde dead on. The blonde just sliced through the wind as if it was nothing, reaching Natsu. Cocking his fist back, the teen slammed it forward. Natsu drained of energy from using rampage mode could do nothing but watch as what he thought was his own life end. The fist stopped a few inches from the salmon colored hair teen, then suddenly a finger flick was received to said teen's head. Igniel Ni nee says you used too much energy, the blonde informed Natsu. Huh? How do you know to San? Natsu asked, the pain not even registering as the blonde spoke. You can ask him yourself. Anko Sensei, they aren't our enemies, the teen told the adult. Are you sure Naruto? I mean they did attack you, the now called Anko told the blonde teen. I'm sure. Let me bring out my family, Naruto told the two groups. Naruto did a few hand seals, reverse summoning, dragon's call. Five smoke clouds appeared around him, silhouettes could be seen in the clouds. As the clouds drifted away, the silhouettes became more visible. Igniel, Grandine, Metallicana, Skiadrum, and finally Wysolohia could be seen in their drake forms. I had wished you could have summoned us in our human forms, Igniel told the blonde. I'm trying okay. I thought you might want to see your children. Naruto informed the five dragons, pointing to the group. Tu san? Is that really you? I thought you had died? Natsu asked Igniel, walking up to the fire drake. Igniel looked at his adopted son, then stood on his hunches and stretched his neck till he was slightly taller than the dragon slayer. He then looked down at the teen with a scrowling face. How many times have I told you not to use rampage mode on so little magic? Igniel asked the dragon slayer. Um. I forgot, Natsu replied, chuckling slightly. Igniel wrapped his tail around Natsu and threw him into ravine wall, are you stupid or something? Do you know how easily rampage mode can kill you, your friends, hell even the world that you are residing in now? TCH, same old Tusan. Natsu replied from the wall, he then rushed forward with his fist cocked and covered in flames. As the fist approached the drake, a hand appeared and blocked it. Natsu followed the hand to the Naruto who just stood there. If you want to hurt Igini, you'll have to duel me, Naruto told the salmon colored dragon slayer. Natsu, I don't think that would be wise, as you don't have enough magical power left. I'll fight him instead. Gajil spoke up, cracking his knuckles lightly, 
his body already starting to be covered in metal. How about this? A two on two match, we win, you guys come with us back to Kanhanagakir. We lose, we leave you guys alone to do whatever you want. Anko compromised. That sounds fair. A tall man with auburn hair and artificial limbs told Anko. Gildart's Clive, I'm the head of this operations. We'll speak more after the match. Anko informed Gildarts, before turning to her team. Hum, Inni. Mini, Mini, Mo. I choose Hanada. Hanada stepped forward to stand next to Naruto, both of them smirked at one another. So Haim, which would you like? Naruto asked, bowing slightly. How good is your fire dragon skill? Hanada asked her boyfriend. Just starting with it. Since I have double affinity to fire. I have to be careful not to burn myself out. Naruto told her doing some light stretching. Fine I'll take Pinky, you can have Metal Head. Hanada told him, chuckling slightly at the two dragon slayers that were looking ticked off. Metal Head. I like her, she's got spunk. Gajil commented, then suddenly felt a cold shiver run down his spine. Turning he saw that Naruto had a huge smile on his face. The smile strained slightly, almost as if you were trying to be nice when you really want to pooch someone in the face. My my, you are friendly towards my girlfriend. Naruto commented as he set up his own body shield. His body slowly turning gray with color, his hair also turning a light gray and started to grow out a little more. Um, move. Anko said to the rest of the two groups. Why? Gildarts asked, looking confused. Last time someone flirted with Hinata. They ended up in the hospital twisted in a pretzel and had iron rods in his hands and feet attaching them together. That was five seconds after the guy slapped Hinata's ass. Anko explained as she jumped up about halfway up the ravine. Oh, guys. Gildart's motion to the rest of the team. Wendy nodded and lift them up to the ledge next to Anko. Shino, 500 on Naruto taking Metal Dude out in 30 seconds, Anko betted. Double for one minute. Shino replied, already counting the money out and setting it into a scroll. Anko did the same, just as a huge torrent of wind rushed past them. Hey, we haven't settled the bet yet, Anko yelled, only to stop mid rant, as she saw Naruto in I am pissed, so fuck off mode. Never mind. Anko managed to squeak out. Um, why are you afraid of him? Gildarts asked her. Because he has five dragons and a biju sealed in him. He can control around two tails of the biju and has had extensive training in the dragon slaying arts. Anko explained to the person. Oh, was all that the man said. Back with the dragon slayers and shinobi. Naruto cracked his knuckles loudly, as he stood waiting for his opponent to make a move. Gajil on the other hand was slightly nervous now, after feeling that immense pressure being pushed to him. Well Haim, we shouldn't keep them waiting. Naruto told the Hayuga grabbing her hand and swinging her around, before launching her at Natsu. Natsu Barley had to bring his arms up as a chakra-covered foot nailed his guard, pushing him back a hundred feet. Hanada suddenly appeared again, striking down with a chakra-covered fist. The fist connected with his face sending him into the wall of the ravine yet again. Damn, if I had Naruto's metal body that would have been much worse, Hanada told the pink-haired dragon slayer. My turn now. Natsu replied in turn, his arms and feet covering themselves in fire. He rushed forward, slamming his fist into the blue net's face. Hanada dodged the strike, curved her fingers into a half fist and hit the dragon slayer in his shoulder. Ah, the fuck was that? Natsu asked out loud, the sudden pain sprouting from his shoulder that had just been hit. Suddenly the fire on his arm started to burn him and spread up his arm. I can't control it. What did you do to me? Natsu asked waving his arm around, trying and failing to put out the raging wildfire on his arm. I forced your nerves to try and reconnect themselves, while leaving your chakra points open. So basically you are burning yourself with your own power. Hanada explained, as she settled into her improved Jukan style. Suddenly a gray being shot past her along with a lighter gray being following at high speeds. Geez, he's gonna burn out. Hanada spoke out loud, before returning to her opponent. With Naruto and Gajil, hold still you poster boy for hot topic. I want to turn you into a metal slime. Naruto informed the metal dragon slayer. Thanks for telling me, now I ain't gonna stop moving. Gajil retorted, jumping out of the way of one of Naruto's punches. 
The punch created a crater that Gajil had been standing in front of. I told you to hold still. Naruto told him, a chakra starting to flow around him mixing with the wind and metal auras around him. What the hell are you? Gajil asked as he threw pieces of metal at him. I am Naruto Uzumaki, the future dragon slayer Hokage of Kohanagakure. Naruto answered, the cloak starting to take on the features of a fox mixed with a dragon. And I will stomp you into a mud hole and drag your ass back out just to stomp it in again. Hmm, we'll see about that. Gajil told him, his arm turning into a sword, and the other into a shield. Bring it. Dragon Slayer form, Metal Knight. Let's play ball. Naruto replied, leaping forward at the metal equipped slayer. He struck out with his hand in a clawed shape, slicing down at the sword. Gajil brought the shield up blocking the the clawed attack, grunting slightly as the air slashed his shield. Jumping back he noticed that there were four claw marks on his shield arm. The fuck was that? Gajil wondered as his shield regrew slowly, seeing that it lacked the swiftness that normally was present. The energy that you have versus the chakra and yuki I contain, which do you think will win? Naruto asked, just so you know. Demonic yuki is poisonous to humans, and you might start feeling it right about now suddenly gajil fell to one knee gasping slightly from the loss of breath and burning he hasn't felt this since he got hit by nastsu and the lightning bastards combined attack you think this will keep me down you are sorely mistaken this just gets me pumped up gajil told the blonde standing up slowly his breath still shallow and ragged huh i might just have to try harder naruto told him in a slightly playful tone Back with Hinata and Natsu Hinata leapt back from the heat of the white hot flames, she quickly shot out a water bullet. Putting out the flames around her, giving her time to breath. The heat had been so intense that she could hardly breath. Natsu smirked slightly, wow, a water mage. That's so cool, my best friend is an ice mage. Mage? I'm a shinobi, not a street preformer, Hinata informed him. Shinobi? Aren't those like the special operations of the Grand Council? Natsu asked, slightly confused. We are having a Q and A in the middle of a fight. Let's get back to me kicking your ass. Hinata told him, disappearing from sight. Natsu barely put up a guard as Hinata appeared next to him kicking him at his neck, to try and knock him out. Geez, give me a second to figure something out. Natsu told the woman, plus, being put against a woman is shameful. Hinata stopped her asphalt and cocked her head, fighting a woman is shameful? With the two groups, oh shit, Anko stated, with a look of fear. What do you mean, oh shit? Gildarts asked, looking slightly worried. Let's just say the last time someone said that fighting a woman was shameful or troublesome or anything negative. The person ended up in the hospital with numerous broken bones and torn muscles. Anko explained to the auburn haired man. Oh shit, Gildarts replied. Exactly, Anko told him. With Naruto and Gajil a sudden pressure filled the ravine, the two dragon slayers turned towards the source. A black aura surrounded Hinata, as Natsu seemed to be unaffected. Do you have any prayers to say to your buddy? Naruto asked, as he knelt down and placed his hands on the ground. Um, not really, what's happening? Gajil asked the blonde curiously. He pissed Hinataheim off. If you don't want to get hurt, I suggest helping me with this barrier. Naruto informed him. What do I have to do? Gajil asked quickly, kneeling next to the blonde. We need to make a super strong metal construction around them, Naruto told the gray haired teen. Okay, Gajil replied, starting to force the iron in the ground to move and form into a dome box like structure. Make it super dense. She'll just punch out of it otherwise, Naruto informed the metal dragon user. How? She can't be that strong. Can she? Gajil questioned. Dude, even if I was at my strongest, I wouldn't fuck with her, Naruto told him looking slightly scared. Fuck. That. Shit. Gajil told him, and dens the metal construction until only a super white, almost clear flame, could cut through it. Inside the construct were sounds of flesh hitting flesh and a few muffled screams that barely made it out. After a few minutes a large dent was made in the metal, and another. Suddenly the metal had hundreds of dents until the the first dent burst open to see a panting Hinata. Sweetheart? Hinata asked softly. Yes Haim? 
Naruto replied, sweating slightly. Am I weak? Hinata asked him. Not that I am aware of, Naruto told the Hyuga heiress. He thought I was. Hinata informed him, pouting slightly. And? Naruto asked. We might have to take him to a hospital, Hinata told him, looking back at the broken form of Natsu. That might be a good idea, Naruto commented, back with the two groups. Now that's over, would you like to tell us who you are? Anko asked in a deadly tone. Yeah, we'll tell you everything. Gildarts replied quickly, not wanting to even see what the inside of the construct looked like. A few hours later, around a campfire, you actually want me to believe that bullshit? Anko asked the group of now named mages. You are a group of mages, sent into the future to stop another group of mages that want to take over the world. And that this Pinky's brother is the leader of the group of evil mages? Yep, that's about it. Gildarts told the purple haired shinobi. Well, that's just fan fucking tastic. How the hell are we supposed to deal with that? Anko asked as she threw her hands up in frustration. First, we need to speak with your leader and look at the history that has happened since we have left. So we get a better grasp at what happened and find out where they could be located. Gildarts explained, While I do that, I need someone to take care of these kiddos. Anko looked over at the two groups conversing with the other. The two groups seemed to be enjoying each other's company the four dragon slayers the most as they talked about their pasts with each other. Let's just say, a lot of things were burnt, pierced, and shredded before the night was done. Well, I guess we need to go back to Kohanagakure to inform the Hokage about this. Then we'll go from there. Anko told the destruction mage. That sounds fine. I'll inform my group that we'll cooperate with you till something happens. I mean, it's not like you are suddenly going to lock us up in chains and place a binding spell on us. Gildarts joked. Anko chuckled nervously, slight scratching her neck. Gildarts sweat dropped, you have some sort of restraint, don't you? Anko pulled out a wad of chakra suppression tags, from what Naruto has to us. You guys are just like an untrained shinobi. So we wanted to be safe with your handling, she explained. Ah. So these are supposed to suppress our energy until we can be trusted? Gildarts asked. Yep, that's the jest. Anko told him, handing the tags to him. Okay, that's fine. I'm actually surprised that these haven't broke down. Gildarts told her, picking up a rock. The rock turned into numerous cubes. That's cool. We need to rest so we can get back to the village ASAP. Anko told the mage. Yeah. Gildarts got up and went to inform his team of what was to happen. This is going to be a long three days back. Anko told herself. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.